Section 17 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Back of Bohemia. Part One. As two ladies came out of the florists in the Rue Royale and moved towards their carriage, the younger of the pair gave a start of surprise and exclaimed, Ernest! Who? said Lady Liddington vaguely. Her niece was already shaking hands with him, a young man with a voluminous necktie and a soft felt hat, who looked poor and clever and bohemian. Ernest, she cried, how glad I am to see you. Kate, who'd have thought of meeting you here? He gazed at her with astonishment and admiration. I should hardly have recognized you. I've grown up. Let me, my aunt, Lady Liddington, you've often heard of Ernest, Aunt Madge. I was his first critic. And your mother and father? Quite well, thanks. They're with you? No, oh no, they're still in Coblins. The governor grumbles to me regularly once a month. The mater bears it better. Poor old governor. He was meant to lounge through life with a rosebud in his buttonhole, wasn't he? I've been living in Paris nearly five years now. And working? And working. I'm a painter, of sorts, at last. I can see you're a painter, laughed the girl. Why of sorts? Art is a very arduous profession, I believe, murmured Lady Liddington politely. Mentally, she was praying that no one who knew her would happen to pass. Really, the young man was a sight. Do you exhibit? Not yet. I only sell. Oh, I always understood... I'm at the lowest of the practical stages, Lady Liddington. At present I sell, somehow. Later on I shall manage to exhibit and be unable to sell. Finally I hope to exhibit and sell too. But the way is long. I see, she replied, profoundly uninterested. A real live artist, said Miss Omerod gaily. How proud you must be. It seems only the other day that you were a boy at home, dreaming dreams. Yes, I was good at dreams. Dreams don't need anatomy. How well I remember it all. You must come and see us, she said. And soon. I've a hundred questions to ask you. What are we doing tomorrow, Aunt Madge? Uh, tomorrow? There's the Elysee in the evening, you know, and the next night, I'm afraid, but if tomorrow afternoon... I shall be delighted, he said. The Victoria drove away, and the two occupants mused for a moment. The elder was the first to speak. Your introduction was delicious. Who is the gentleman? You don't mean to say you don't know him? Ernest! Yes, I heard you call him Ernest. I shouldn't do it again if I were you. Hasn't he a surname by any chance? Not call him? Oh, how absurd! He's Ernest Malick. Why, we were almost like brother and sister, till his people had to leave Moyamahain and go abroad. My mother must have spoken of them to you a thousand times. Oh, said Lady Lanington, he's Cyril Malloch, is he? But you're not in the wilds of County Roscommon now, remember? You're grown up, and— And the Malochs have lost all their money, concluded Miss Omerod with warmth. Don't leave that out, because it's really what you want to say. Yes, they're ruined, and what of it? If you think it's any reason why I should cut a boy in the streets who— My dear said the other plaintively. I did not suggest that you should cut anybody in the streets. I only hinted. It's very unkind of you to talk like that. 
the girl turned apologetically poor aunt madge yes i was bolting wasn't i i'm sorry but if you knew how happy it made me to see him it was like a bit of my childhood crossing the road it was ernest who taught me to set a horse and how to throw a fly it was ernest who taught me not to paint he used to kiss me up to the time i was fifteen my dear she looked apprehensively at the coachman's back don't so he is lord fernahoe's nephew that young man in the distressing costume of course he has no chance of succession not the slightest fernahoe has a son and i've met him he's twenty years of age and quite offensively robust wins cups and things and takes absurd dumbbells in his portmanteau when he stays anywhere your friend can go on dressing like a disreputable glazier for ever if that's the only prospect he can boast i don't suppose he even thinks of it his clothes seem to jar you like an anarchist banner he used to be rather a dandy i can tell you till the crash came and lord fernahoe might have paid off the mortgage without feeling it hateful man but he quarrelled with the malics years ago very strange isn't it perhaps his brother did something disgraceful why on earth should it be mr malik's fault well i'm sure i don't know my dear only one of them must have been to blame it's very certain and it's always pleasanter to blame the people you don't meet don't you think so how sweet those roses smell but what a price i'm sorry we bought them men said of madge liddington that she was a good sort her worldliness was not disagreeable not too real she herself said that she knew what she ought to do but somehow never did it her theories were more cynical than her heart and on the morrow when malik came she was gracious and even cordial he had made some concessions to the fashionable address his clothes if shabby were less unconventional to-day and obviously he had no idea of falling in love with kate there was too little formality between them for a chaperone to be wholly pleased but at the same time there was nothing on either side to suggest the existence of sentiment tell me all said miss ormerod tell me frankly does it come up to your expectations you're a painter you're in paris you're in bohemia is it all as lovely as you thought it was going to be does everybody talk art and rave about the time when he will make a school and discuss his methods over box and cigarettes what are you painting now can we see your studio which am i to answer first <laughs> he laughed talk tell me what the life's like it's all right yes some of us do prose about our methods i'm afraid and we drink a great deal many box when we've the money to pay for them and my paris isn't a bit like your paris it's a different world it must be heavenly if i'd had any talent i should have loved to go in for it myself and do you know any clever people besides artists authors and actors i mean do you know any people with long hair frenchmen seem to go to one extreme or the other their hair's either waving in the breeze or too short to part all the people who come here are the cropped and dull ones kate well they are aunt madge do you know sardou or alphonse daudet or sarah bernhardt he shook his head no i know one or two english correspondents i did a piece of newspaper work myself not long ago really in collaboration gladstone was expected in paris and my friend thought he'd like to send an interview with him to his paper we rode it together at one of the tables outside a cafe on the boule miche while gladstone was still travelling towards the gare du nord we credited him with some highly interesting views i don't know if they were ever published oh and do you prefer living here to being in london inquired lady liddington or couldn't you work so well at home i've scarcely thought about it he said with a shrug this is my home now 
oh i should say london be ghastly unless one were making a big income for the smaller fry dull i shouldn't like it i've heard about it a fellow that i know here works for london black and white work you know oh rather funny did you ever see a magazine called the lantern it's very earnest and only sixpence last month poor tassie had to illustrate the line he strolled meditatively through the summer night he made the man lighting a cigar the other day he got his sketch back the editor wrote reprovingly that in the lantern they didn't smoke he stayed an hour and in the circumstances could one do less when he rose than fix an evening for his dining there after he had dined there what was more natural than that he should call two afternoons a dinner and a host of mutual memories the earlier friendship was revived and lady liddington bowed to the inevitable they saw him frequently now he sent tickets to them and met them to explain the virtues of the pictures and if the elder woman failing to understand why magenta cattle should graze on purple grass sometimes sat down with a headache and left kate to wander round the room with him alone was she a chaperone without defence they were not in love but they were in danger he had begun to look forward to the meetings and so had the girl he interested her she was interesting to him he had been right in saying that they belonged to different worlds and that their lives were the antithesis of each other had itself a fascination the deeper for the fact that they had once been so much alike he knew his bullier his montmartre the minor studios and the third-rate cafes he wasn't unfamiliar with the interior of the nearest mont de piete but of the paris unfolded to lady liddington's niece he knew very little it was a novel experience to him to see a dinner-table poetized by flowers and a salviati service it was even a strange thing to malik to be sitting in a room with two ladies and listening to ladies conversation if as the weeks passed he told himself that he was being a fool it must be conceded that the temptation to folly was a strong one but it must also be acknowledged that he told the truth he already thought much too often of miss omerod for a man who could not hope to marry her and yet he continued to see her because he was too weak to stay away then he knew that he loved her he ceased at last to excuse himself by saying that he found her companionable that there was nothing in it he knew that he loved her that the world was peopled by men women and kate omerod that she stood on a plane by herself different from every one else paris now the paris that was open to him stank in his nostrils when he could not be with her during the day he worked doggedly and badly finding occupation a relief to his impatience but in the evening to paint was impossible and it was in the evening that he ate his heart out he had not the faintest right ever to own his feelings to her and he was aware of it if he acted properly he would assert that he had to go to caudebec or somewhere and say good-bye but he could not string himself to the necessary pitch and after all he argued since he confessed nothing asked for nothing why should he deny himself the only happiness that he possessed yes he was passionately in love with her but if he didn't say so what harm did it do it would end by making him infernally miserable well that was his affair he would be infernally miserable anyhow however if the man was not disposed to do his duty the time had arrived when lady liddington had to do hers one morning when he called with some tickets and was shown into the drawing-room she was in it alone reading a tocknitz novel kate was practising he was told indeed he could hear the piano i was going to write to you said lady liddington we're returning to london he stared at her blankly 
it's an awful bore we meant to stay quite two months longer but things pull me back you go soon tomorrow and i'm such a shocking sailor miss omerod had begun chopin's second nocturne malik listened to a line of it intensely without realizing he listened he felt that he had turned pale and that it was essential to say something but his mind refused to yield a commonplace lady liddington who had avoided plain speaking with her niece by the same pretext was no longer confident that the necessity for plain speaking had been escaped i'm sorry he said at last he played with the book she had put down is it good he asked desperately it's a romance no stereotyped a romance always ends with a marriage isn't that realistic marriage is generally the end of romance you're practical mr malek quite the reverse i'm afraid he stammered hot with the sudden fear that she might be imputing mercenary motives their gaze met in a pause and she answered him gently ah well to be practical is often distressing this is au revoir then he got up shall i see miss omerod i don't think she has been told you're here i'll let her know please don't trouble i can say good-bye as i pass the room i hope you will have a smooth crossing he wasn't forbidden and his face thanked her kate lifted her head as the handle turned you so you're going away he said huskily we go tomorrow her voice was nervous your aunt just told me i shan't see you any more not before we leave i suppose i mayn't see you again at all perhaps you won't come back to paris oh yes some time i shall miss you horribly i don't know what i shall do without you we've been very good friends she stroked a key of the piano slowly it seems a long while since we met again good-bye said malik jerkily he put out his hand and she rose his misery glowed in his eyes in hers but he dared not read them he caught her hand to his lips and kissed it and went out lady liddington heard the door close the nocturne was not resumed part two well it was all over he had never been so wretched in his life he walked away aimlessly it was nothing to him where he went outside the grand hotel he collided with a gentleman hurrying from the courtyard both looked round with resentment the gentleman was his father the next instant malik realized that his father was in deep mourning good god my mother he faltered your mother was never better exclaimed the other gaily clapping him on the shoulder she sends her love and a thousand messages i was on my way to you let me look at you well 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 it is good to see you again ernest you know the news don't you news what news what news you haven't heard prepare yourself he chuckled prepare yourself my boy something good it is very sad returned his father suddenly assuming an expression of solemnity very terrible but as we have seen nothing of them for so long my brother and his son are dead drowned a yacht accident poor maurice he had his faults but poor maurice let's go inside you haven't lunched have you i'll tell you all about it the bohemian listened half stupefied your lord furneho he said your lord furneho now and you're the honourable ernest malik better than your profession eh not but what you might have a studio still if you fancied it it would be rather chic and all the pretty women could come and have their portraits painted but to think you didn't know 
I haven't opened a paper for a week. But, but Miss Ormerod's here with Lady Liddington. It's amazing they haven't seen it. Well, of course they've seen it. I can swear they haven't. Great heavens, Governor, what a change for you. Yes, said the peer complacently. It'll be a change, after Coblenz. I've borne my reverses, Ernest. I've never complained, but my health is not what it was. I, I haven't the physique for the life of a poor man. He spoke as if he had been condemned to be a dock laborer. How do you think I'm looking? You're looking as well as ever, and as young. Nonsense, nonsense. Ha, <laughs> ha. What'll you drink? We'd better have champagne. My doctor advises a glass of champagne. You must order some clothes. You are... You are damn shabby. Go to a tailor today. Don't forget. What are you doing with yourself this evening? Nothing, said Malik. That's to say... Nothing that won't keep. You'll meet me, and we'll have a little dinner together, and... Bignon's is gone, isn't it? Oh, yes. Where do you go, as a rule? I? He smiled grimly. I'm afraid my haunts would hardly suit you. No, I suppose not. Well, all that's finished. You've grown very handsome, Ernie. You remind me of myself when I was your age. I may say that now, an old man. But you look dazed. It was a horrible affair. Poor Maurice, poor Maurice, but don't look so dazed. You've staggered me, said Malik, gulping his wine. I, I, if you don't mind, I'll leave you now. Where shall we meet? Call for me here, said Fernahoe, airily. Say six o'clock. There are some things I've got to attend to. I have to be shaved and... By the way, tomorrow I can let you have a substantial sum. In the meanwhile, here's something to go on with. I suppose it'll be useful. Six o'clock, then, sharp. And don't forget the tailor. Ta-ta. Six o'clock. Thanks. I won't be late. Lord Fernahoe signed to a cabman. His son stood stupidly on the curb after the cab had rattled away. His eyes were wide, and his mouth was set. After a minute, he crossed the road and turned down the Avenue de l'Opera, still with the fixed stare. Among the traffic of the Rue de Rivoli, he hesitated. He seemed in doubt. Then he shrugged his shoulders and slouched on, away from fashion, to the place Saint-Michel. On the boulevard, one or two threw him a greeting. He did not know it. His face was grey. Now and again he wiped the perspiration from it with a hand that shook. Threading his way through a maze of dilapidated streets, he came to a narrow doorway next to a shop window, packed high with charcoal and wood. There was a flight of dirty stairs, and he mounted them very slowly. The room was bedroom and parlor, too. The bed was in disorder. On the table, the remainder of a stew that had been hot two hours ago was stiffening in the gravy. A baby of twelve months, unkempt, uncared for, lay fretting on a pillow on the floor, and a woman in a flannel dressing gown sat reading an English novelette. She turned her untidy head, shedding a hairpin as she moved. "'Oh, here you are!' said Ernest Malick's wife. He threw himself on the bed. I'm here. Have you brought back any money? Take all you want. My word, she exclaimed with delight. You're in luck. Yes, he groaned. I'm devilish lucky. She stooped for the fallen hairpin and picked her teeth with it. Where does it come from? You've never sold that old solitude, surely. Oh, for God's sake, be quiet, he said. I'm tired. Where have you been? Everything's got cold. Shall I hot it up for you? No, never mind, Bessie. It won't take a minute. I don't want it. How's that? she asked sullenly. I had déjeuner out. Oh, you had your déjeuner out again. Who with? 
you've taken to dirgenaying out a good deal haven't you jolly for me i'm sure stuck at home with the kid while you're enjoying yourself seems to me you're all alike does it yes it does she said angrily imitating his inflection yes it does mr sneerer and i tell you more i don't believe there's a decent one among the lot of you do you hear oh i saw you the other day in the rue scribe with two women very classy they were to look at you didn't see me did you but i saw you who were they answer me that they were ladies that i might have known better if i had had more sense i suppose that's meant for me you didn't look at the young one as if you'd like to eat her up did you be quiet he burst out now then be quiet i won't have you speak about her i've had enough oh what a fine gentleman not speak about her eh his wife mustn't so much as speak about her we've come to a pretty pass listen to your father my blessing and she was no beauty neither find better figures than hers in any life class for all her swank any girl who ain't his wife that's it so long as she ain't his wife any girl's good enough for a man i could look like it too if you gave me the money to do it on won't have me speak about her who do you think you're talking to i've a good mind to smack your face he clasped his hands on his head and lay motionless i'm tired he repeated wearily for god's sake shut up i want to go to sleep but it wasn't true he wanted to think he wanted to curse himself and die in memory he was reliving the night of his first meeting with her an english girl in a divan off the boulevard st martin insulted on the evening of his presence by a french student he recalled the enthusiasm with which he had knocked the man down the general row the cry of english chaps forward she wept and blessed him on the pavement at two o'clock in the morning it transpired that she was virtuous and he afforded the quarter another example of the english eccentricity after reflection he offered to send her back to london she had been unhappy there she wept again and didn't want to go he supported her until she found employment as a model she was pretty was the end surprising she thought she was in love with him let him see as much and he was in love with romance whom had he to study life with her would be very jolly it was a boy's infatuation for bohemia while bohemia was foreign to him his front had been delightful he married her this was the back of it she picked up the paper and he regarded her under lowered lids she was pretty still but he hated every expression on her face he hated her every attitude and the notes of her laugh every little harmless habit that she had made his nerves ache it was half past four this evening he would have to confess the truth to his father how to do it and he must tell bessie of her new importance and witness her ecstasies the hands of a tawdry french clock crept on if he meant to keep the appointment he must go soon the novelette engrossed her now flies swarmed about the table settling on the meat the dirty baby slept when the clock struck again malik dragged himself from the unmade bed to announce his marriage end of section 17「Section 18 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Lady of Lions. The jovial solicitor who smacked his clients on the back had absconded, and the minor poet had no longer fifty pounds per annum. Although he was a minor poet, which, strangely enough, is a term of contempt in this country, though we are enjoined to be grateful for even small mercies, he was as human as minor novelists and minor critics, and he suffered. Also he woke. He realized how small had been the world's demand for the wares in which he dealt. He acknowledged that for twenty years he had been living on his little income, not on his little books. His name was Smith. It was, perhaps, one of the reasons why his poetry was unread. Only a reviewer possessed of unusual courage could have discovered the great poetry of Mr. Smith. Only a poet devoid of commercial instincts could have failed to adopt nom de guerre. In the face of disaster, Mr. Smith did not make precisely this reflection, but he reflected painfully that a lack of commercial ability was no longer a matter to be recognized with a smile. He stood among the daffodils in the village garden and asked heaven what would become of him, he was seven and thirty. The only craft that he had learnt was useless, and he had to earn his bread and cheese. As heaven returned no answer, he sought the advice of friends. He was a lovable creature, though a writing man, and his friends were sympathetic. They all invited him to dinner, and assured him warmly that they would bear his necessities in mind. If anything turned up, he might rely upon their telegraphing to him. Being of a trustful disposition, Mr. Smith returned to the daffodils, encouraged. And they withered while he waited for a telegram. When they hung their heads, he sought advice again. This time his friends did not invite him to dinner, but they pointed out to him, lest he should overlook it, that he was a poet, in other words, that he was a difficult person to serve. "'You have no experience, you see,' they said frankly. "'You are intelligent, but you have no experience, Robert.' When a man is untravelled in the groove that we ourselves tread, we say that he has no experience. One afternoon the poet went abroad. The journey cost him a penny, and he travelled from Charing Cross as far as the bank. He was bound for an office in Lombard Street, and as he called by appointment, a clerk showed him promptly to Mr. Hutton's private room. The businessman who received him had once been a little boy in a sailor suit, and he and Robert had played together in a nursery. Today he had numerous financial irons in the fire, and one of them required an obedient gentleman to watch it. Affection suggested Robert for the post. The duties were simple, and the salary was slight, but if the iron came out in good condition, there was to be a slice of the iron, too. They chatted for a long while. Robert was admitted to some confidences about the other irons, the patents and the shares and the concessions. All the time that he listened he was seeing the businessman as a little boy in a sailor suit again, and was awestruck to hear the little boy talking so glibly of such mysteries. Blankly he felt that he himself had omitted to grow up, he decided that people were right in declaring that he had no experience. It appeared to him suddenly that he had learnt nothing in his life. But, of course, he had learnt many things, though never the most important one. How to make money. Often they were interrupted by the telephone bell, and during one of the colloquies on the telephone, Mr. Hutton seemed depressed. 
Robert feared he was being browbeaten until he hung up the receiver and announced, smiling, that he had made five hundred pounds by that conversation. It was miraculous. Robert had not made five hundred pounds by twenty years of work. "'Let's go out and get a cup of coffee,' said Mr. Hutton, and piloted the poet through a maze of alleys to a retiring doorway. "'What will you have to drink?' The poet discovered that after two o'clock, a cup of coffee in the city is generally a synonym for a whiskey and soda. The little bar was crowded, and he was surprised at seeing such a number of businessmen doing nothing so leisurely. One man to whom he was introduced asked him if he knew how the house closed, but he did not even know what it meant. They discoursed in groups and a strange language. Robert was flooded by compassion for the barmaid. All expounded different views, and all the views were equally unintelligible to him. The only point of unanimity he perceived was the wisdom of having a fiver each way. As often as anybody entered, the several groups waved hands, and the newcomer accepted a whiskey and soda with a piece of lemon in it among the group he fancied best. On leaving, Mr. Hutton remarked that he had sometimes made as much as a thousand pounds by dropping in there. Robert reeled. Soon he went every day to the strange land where man talked a language that he did not know. It had been decided that he should watch the iron in the neighborhood, so that Mr. Hutton might extend a guiding hand without discomfort, and an office was rented in Eastcheap. Eastcheap is a sour-smelling thoroughfare, into which dirty loafers emerge from the courts of Billingsgate, in order that they may have more room to spit. Distressing as Robert found it to sit in the office, he found it more distressing to go out. Of course, not many people see the city. Myriads saw it once, but that was when they came there in their youth. Few are to be discovered in the city who remember how it looks. Occasionally, a clerk in his first birth may be found who sees the city, but he is not promised to the casual searcher, for city clerks as a body are observant in the streets of one thing only. They observe neckties. This passion, to which the hosiers of the district pander inordinately, was displayed to the poet between the hours of one and two, wet or fine. From desk to food, from food to desk, streamed the black multitude, expressionless, torpid and unseeing, until neckties flaunted in a window. Then the vacant faces brightened, and there was a block. The rule of the pavement is known everywhere excepting in the city, where it is most needed, but at the hosier's windows pedestrianism became more than an effort, it became a feat. Robert's eyes had no custom in them. Robert did see the city, and he was unhappier than he had poetry to tell. For that matter, he did not try to tell it. He wrote nothing now but figures and commercially ungrammatical epistles which took him a long time to compose. For twenty years he had believed his rushlight was a star. He had done with illusion at last. Illusion was in its grave, and the failure laid his hope of laurels on the top. Yet he thought tenderly of illusion. The funeral was over, but he mourned. He had embraced a new career, but he did not love it. Although he repeated that the past was dead, he could not prevent its ghost haunting Eastcheap. There were moments when it chilled the iron. Often, as he forced his dreary way to luncheon, it walked beside him. He lunched sometimes with his preserver in the restaurants of the employers. Generally, he lunched with the ghost in the restaurants of the employed. He noted that in the former the meat was tainted less frequently. 
on the other hand the employed were served by clean quiet girls instead of by sleazy vociferous waiters one afternoon he lunched at an establishment that he had not tried before the ghost had been insistent all the morning he found a vacant seat hung up his hat and examined the bill of fare he was in one of the more modest restaurants of messrs lyons and around him young men and women with blank faces chumped beefsteak pudding and read sixpenny editions of the novels that are written for them the girl beside him ordered apple tart her voice was pleasant and momentarily he regretted that in reading she leant her cheek upon her palm for she hid her profile it should have been a pretty profile to match her voice moved by an impulse of curiosity he glanced at the page she pondered and then he dropped the menu she was reading his own verse good god he exclaimed i beg your pardon said the girl surveying him with dignity i apologize stammered the poet i was startled evidently she found his excuse inadequate and he was thankful that at this moment they were left with the table to themselves i meant that i was startled to see the book you were reading he explained i see nothing startling in it said the lady still frigid he felt that she might have expressed herself more happily but he was in no position to rebuke her of course in one sense it isn't startling at all he concurred in fact it's very feeble i am afraid i can't agree with you rejoined his reader and the haughtiness of her contradiction warmed his heart you can't mean you really like it i like it very much she had grey eyes that challenged him scornfully he sunned himself in her disdain did you buy it he asked a tremor in his tone really she began but his air was so respectful that she added the next instant yes for two pence second hand ah said the poet still it's a most extraordinary occurrence she looked away from him with a frown. Her attention was divided between his verse and the apple tart. Robert sat a prey to temptation. To melt her by avowing himself would be ridiculous, but agreeable. Succumbing, he murmured, To tell you the truth, I am glad you like the book. Eh? she said. Why? Because I wrote it. It should have been a dramatic moment, but the girl bungled her part and disbelieved him. Fully five minutes were devoted to convincing her. However, the five minutes brought such a flutter of pink to her cheeks, so tender a glow into her eyes, that the time was by no means wasted. "'I couldn't expect to meet a poet in the city,' she pleaded." "'And certainly I couldn't expect to meet any gentle reader here,' said Robert. He examined the slim volume ruefully. "'In such good condition, and only two pence,' he complained. "'If it had been more, I mightn't have bought it,' she said. He found himself resigned to the books having been marked down to two pence. She told him that she wrote shorthand in an office in Cornhill— East Cheap lay in the same direction, and after she had gone he felt that it would have been pleasurable to walk some of the way beside her. He was sorry, too, that he had omitted to inquire if she irradiated the restaurant daily. On the morrow he betook himself to Lyons with hope. He descried the lady at a distant table, and it had the charm of vacant chairs. There was no reason why he should ignore them. "'You are often in the city, then?' she asked as he sat down. "'I come every day,' said Robert, and seeing she was mystified, he added, "'I am in an office here, like you.' But plainly this mystified her more still. "'Do you mean you are in business?' "'Truly,' 
he told her i think i shall have roast beef i should try the mutton she said but you are a poet i used to fancy myself one it was very absurd but before they paid their bills he was informing her that he had divorced his muse and was in a foreign land alone this time they left the restaurant together that o oh, foreigner said the lady of lyons is the royal exchange i know said robert but what do they exchange in it i have no idea she confessed if you like we will ask a policeman a curious thing about policemen remarked the poet is that if you want a polite answer you should avoid putting your question politely they are conspicuously a class who respect rudeness how long have you been coming to the city to learn so much about it i have been coming to the city for nine years she said and i have learnt a great deal i know now where the tower is and which of the benches under the trees make you feel most harrison ainsworthy and i know the shop in cornhill that sells the best twopenny tarts they are small but peerless if you hadn't bought my verses you might have had another sighed robert some day when i have made my fortune i shall give you one thank you she said i suppose you know what you are looking at across the road i am looking at a bookshop replied the poet you were meant to see the mansion house demurred his guide where the lord mayor lives i do not like lord mayors said robert they never ask me to their literary dinners they are punished for it said the girl once a year at midnight they drop their little glass slippers and their beautiful couch turns back into a pumpkin it serves them right said the poet vengefully but they were not always so foolish as this to meet at luncheon became their custom and sometimes their confidences were quite practical by dint of lunching hurriedly on occasion they made time to reach the tower together and he approved her taste in benches it was on the bench one day when the sun shone that she told him her history her history was so commonplace that she apologized for relating it and her surprise was vast that he fell to reverie why he cried we have found a moral it is you who are to be pitied not i what have i to mourn in the city i have buried nothing here but the gift of making little verses but you you have buried the divinest gift of the gods your beautiful youth you have never had any pleasure in your life yet you are content i am ashamed not long afterwards his preserver exclaimed bobby i think you're getting acclimatized you're putting your back into it if you don't take care you'll make money i aim at making money said the poet with commercial staidness and added irresponsibly i want to buy two penny tarts it was just like him to bid farewell to verse-making and then to find his best poetry in the city there are dreamers who would turn every opportunity to disadvantage but the iron is shaping so well that when it becomes a limited liability company with another manager robert slice should be substantial we may imagine him going back to the daffodils it is not impossible that there will be orange blossoms and in the meantime there is certainly the luncheon hour end of section eighteen section nineteen of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Tavarish. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Third M. Otto van Norden wrote ballads that were popular, but to attain this eminence he had in his youth sacrificed commercial prospects which might easily have provided him with wealth. So he often lamented his choice of a career as a terrible mistake. Nevertheless, as he had some private means, his life was no martyrdom, though he aspired vainly to a mansion and a motor. He had pleasant rooms, a good tailor, was frequently to be seen at the second-best restaurants, and spent as much of his time as possible on the continent. It was indeed Van Norden who shocked the owner of a confession book by describing his favorite pastime as leaving England and his pet aversion as coming back to it. At the age of forty he fell seriously in love. He was a selfish man, though he inclined to lyrics like Heaven were a void without thee and my life for my lady's glove, and he battled against the temptation bravely. Violet was young, captivating, and sang his ballads with considerable expression. He had really no chance. He took a wife and a villa in Dulwich, and if the music pirates hadn't begun to be so industrious, it is possible that he might have escaped regret even in the suburb that looks like a cemetery. To write popular songs in a country where stolen music was exposed for sale on every curbstone buttered no parsnips, and for matrimony the composer's private means were a tight fit. Not many quarter days had elapsed before he felt that his marriage had been as big a blunder as his profession. Music and marriage, sighed Van Norden to the long, sad, empty roads of Dulwich. But for music and marriage, how well off I might have been! And then it struck him that both the calamities of his life begun with an M. Some men might have attached no importance to it. Otto van Norden was impressed. He said that it was queer, this recurrence of the initial M. He was of the opinion that it meant something. Perhaps there was a warning to be derived. Yes, that must be it. If a third catastrophe occurred, doubtless the third too would be alliterative and perhaps fatal. M was evidently an initial ominous to him, an initial to be shunned. From that moment he grew nervous of things beginning with an M. He abandoned the wish to revisit Mentone, and he would not have attempted a march if his publishers had begged for one. More quarter days flashed by, and meanwhile his fortunes remained unchanged. Self-respecting citizens still bought the stolen music, the private income was still a tight fit, and Dulwich was still the most melancholy of the suburbs. Then, when he had been married for three annual rentals, and a water rate over, hopes were entertained of a son and heir, and Violet suggested calling him Marmaduke. The composer was profoundly agitated, her proposal was no caprice. She had an uncle, Mama Duke, with money, and Van Norden knew very well that opposition must appear to her unreasonable, since he could not explain it without hurting her feelings. He contested the point with tact. Kindly, but firmly, he disparaged the name of Mama Duke for months, all through the spring, in fact. It was a name, he pointed out, more adapted to an elderly gentleman of portly presence than to a baby. It was not a tractable name, not amenable to abbreviation. 
assuming that the child had a sensitive disposition violet would condemn him to years of suffering for a boy who was christened marmaduke would when he went to school certainly be called marmalade the last argument was at once successful violet's eyes filled with tears and as she thanked her husband for sparing the poor little fellow the consequences of her thoughtlessness the composer's relief was deeper than any who mock presentiments can understand this was the first m that had menaced him since he perceived the significance of the initial to him and nothing else noteworthy occurred until november one day in november when a pink and white bassinet was in readiness for the little fellow's advent, the master of the house awoke feeling as if he had a marble under his tongue. He did not mention the matter to Violet, but breakfasting with such an unfamiliar mouth was so discomforting that he sent the servant up to Dr. Lachlan with a request to him to look in during the morning i don't know what's happened to my mouth lachlan he said it's for all the world as if a marble had rolled underneath my tongue in the night let's have a look at it said the medical man ah yes yes that hasn't come in the night it's been coming for some time is it serious no not necessarily it wants removing removing echoed van norden what do you mean by removing you don't mean operating don't you think a a good lotion oh no we shall have to operate said dr lachlan you may put it at the morning after next meantime i'll get a competent anaesthetist and arrange about a nurse for you but but it's very serious indeed faltered the composer dismayed am i sure to get better people sink under operations we know that every operation is performed successfully but the patient often dies the same day what's the matter with me what have i got it's what we call mixoma my god exclaimed van norden it begins with an m he was now intensely alarmed for himself he was also alarmed lest the news should reach the ears of violet who was in no condition to be told such things however on the next morning but one she was unable to rise so the preliminaries passed unnoticed by her in a room on the first floor madame awaited the arrival of the sun and air in a room on the second monsieur awaited the arrival of the surgeon few circumstances could have been more adverse to marital tranquillity few circumstances therefore could have been less favourable to the operation the first person to tap at the second floor door was the nurse engaged by dr lachlan good morning nurse said van norden nobody has come yet sit down and make yourself at home thank you said the nurse she added sympathetically putting on her apron it's a trying time for you i hear what with one thing and another sir lachlan came in as blithely as if it were a party well how are we this morning he asked good spirits that's right you'll be glad you've had this done you'll feel much better once it's over ah here's the man i'm waiting for morning major ah uh, dr major pleased to meet you murmured the composer feebly untruthful already the bedroom was taking a strange aspect to him the aspect of a hospital bandages and bottles seemed to have sprung from nowhere lachlan poured fluids briskly in basins before the window and major set out mysterious articles from a black bag on the chest of drawers 
the paraphernalia spread incessantly, and the nurse continued as if by magic to produce sheets and cans of hot water without having quitted the room. I think we'll move the bed, nurse, said Lachlan, and they pulled it into the middle of the floor. The anesthetist felt the patient's pulse and applied the stethoscope, and Van Norden noticed for the first time that the pattern of the wallpaper resembled pink mushrooms in bunches of vermicelli. An oppressive tent was placed over his mouth. He felt very helpless, very childish all at once. The vapor of the A.C.E. grew suffocating. His heart began to thump as if it would burst. He signaled the danger to Lachlan, and Lachlan gave a nod. Van Norden glared impotently. He was sure that he was the victim of a blunder, that this pounding of the heart was too violent to be safe. Now there was a roaring in his ears. The idiots were killing him, and he was gagged, defenseless. Momentarily he was faint with terror, and then a lethargy, which he mistook for courage, stole through him. It flattered his vanity to perceive with what listlessness he confronted death. He was being a hero. It was not unpleasant. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Nothing mattered in the least. His next impression was of being very cramped. In the midst of his consciousness, there lurked the remembrance of the operation, and he assumed vaguely that it was over. He lay waiting to be congratulated, wondering why nobody spoke to him. Had he been left alone? He felt so bewilderingly limp that he couldn't turn, but he opened his mouth to say, Are you there, Lachlan? and to his horror emitted nothing but a baby's bleat. His mouth remained open with amazement, and gigantic fingers suddenly thrust something sickening into it, while an unfamiliar voice made ridiculous noises at him. Consternation held Van Norden spellbound. There were seconds in which he feared that he was insane. Presently another thought assailed him, one so startling that his blood ran cold. Minutes passed, minutes too terrible for words to paint. He gathered the fortitude to examine as much of his person as was exposed. The hands belonging to him were minute, the hands of an infant. He stared at them aghast and shuddering. There could be no doubt of it. He had died under the operation and had been born again. All that was natural enough, but the unforeseen and fearful thing was that he still remembered. He was once more a baby. Whose? The immense import of the question throbbed in him. Where he lay he could see no more of the room than the ceiling, and he was unable to judge whether he had been reincarnated in a mansion or a hovel. There had been a royal princess expecting a baby, he reflected. Great Scotland Yard, thought Van Norden, suppose I am royalty this time. But the remaining pessimism in him rejected the fancy almost as it rose. Too good to be true, he mused. I expect my father's a beggarly artist. Or a curate. I don't suppose I'm even an only child. It's a ghastly situation. I wonder at what age one begins to forget. The woman with the gigantic fingers, or fingers comparatively gigantic, was speaking to someone now, and Van Norden listened intently, in the hope of ascertaining something of his prospects. Yes, said the woman, and her too, poor soul, don't know anything about it yet, of course. They won't tell her for days. He died a moment before the mite was born. 
wrote songs and such like. Yes, they say the operation was quite successful, but he didn't rally. Too weak, you know. Oh, awfully sad. Grant me patience, thought Van Norden. I might have known it. I'm in that damned house in Dulwich still. A quiet little thing, poor orphan, ain't it? The monthly nurse went on, and then she leant over the cradle and made the ridiculous noise at him again. In a burst of fury, Van Norden tried to swear at her, but he could produce only the baby's bleat. He yearned to be quiet, to be left undisturbed. There was so much to consider. He had allowed his life policy to lapse, and now he bitterly repented the false economy. He wondered what the furniture would fetch, and if Violet would be enabled to bring him up properly. Perhaps his father-in-law would come to her assistance. His grandfather, he ought to say now. It would be a pretty kettle of fish if his widow, that was to say his mother, were left to her own resources. What would become of him? A board school and a junior clerkship. I suppose it's entirely problematical whether I shall even inherit my musical talent, mused the unhappy infant. It's a nice lookout for me, I must say. But there, added the woman, a girl baby always does keep quieter than a boy. I am always thankful to see it a girl. Ookie tookie then, ain't I my precious? Law, the blessed lamb's choking. Van Norden had indeed turned purple in the face. A girl? Culminating calamity, a girl! The blankness of the girl's outlook, the poverty of the marriage that she must expect to make, was overwhelming. Now, why? Van Norden asked herself passionately. Why has this thing happened to me? Among all the births that were taking place in the world, couldn't they have spared me a decent one? I don't harp on a palace, but say reasonable advantages? Opulent people are having sons every minute, yet I must go as the daughter of a widow in straitened circumstances. Ah! Upon my soul, it's heartrending. However, when she and Violet met again, she was somewhat consoled by the warmth of her mother's welcome, and after the news of the bereavement was broken, the young widow covered so tenderly of the manifold virtues of darling papa that Van Norden was quite touched. A good sort meditated Van Norden as Violet joggled her up and down. I had no idea at the time that she appreciated me so much. In hours of comparative resignation there was nothing more fascinating to Van Norden while she lay in the pink and white bassinet than to mark the development of her new identity the process by which the trivial pains and pleasures of the moment attained supreme importance, and the pressing anxieties which beset her at the hour of her birth became gradually blurred. The fact would have appeared incredible to the baby formerly, had she heard with how little fret and jar the human mind adapted itself to another form and sex. She would not have believed the ego could renounce so easily its interest in matters that, to its previous incarnation, had been absorbing. And doubtless, she reflected, she would disbelieve it again later. Her attitude towards the bottle, for instance, fascinated her extremely. At first, she had regarded it with disdain. Even when she recognized its suitability to her physical needs, she had merely tolerated the thing as a disagreeable necessity. This contempt, this suction under protest, was very brief. Soon she grew to relish the bottle, to clamor for it when it was late. 
Then, too, she was able to extract amusement from a coral and bells, and was again engrossed by the ticking of a watch. Marvellous, thought Van Norden, while she hovered at the parting of the ways. Marvellous thing, nature, upon my word! But a trifle humiliated at moments like these, she would throw the coral, or watch, on the floor and set up a howl. The devoted Violet often mistook the humiliation for a pin, and undressed her, an indignity which annoyed Van Norden more still. Before she was six weeks old, Van Norden had ceased to consider the financial position, and accepted without questioning who provided. She began to yield to the charm of the bottle and the watch, unreservedly and had scarcely a remaining care. Only while she plucked at Violet's crape, the past whispered in her, and a dim consciousness that the relations between her mother and herself were involved clouded the infantile brow. "'What's she thinking about, a love?' Violet would murmur, swaying her to and fro, doesn't she look worried a pit? And from the lap that was once Van Norden's wife's, Van Norden would raise great eyes to her solemnly. When eight or nine months had passed, this glimmer of memory, which had then become nearly extinct, was fanned to ardor by a painful circumstance. They had gone to Dieppe with Violet's parents, and in the hotel Violet made the acquaintance of a major somebody. The acquaintance had progressed when Van Norden was first brought in contact with him in the garden, and the gentleman paid the pretty widow marked attentions and grinned at her baby propitiatingly. "'Jolly little chap,' remarked the major, worrying Van Norden with a forefinger. "'It's a little girl, Major,' said Violet, smiling reproval. "'Oh, confound it all! I mean, how stupid of me!' faltered the Major. "'Lovely little thing, anyhow. I suppose you're awfully proud of her, Mrs. Van Norden, eh? The only pebble on the beach, what? It seems awfully rum to see you with a baby, though. You look such a girl, don't you know?' "'What nonsense!' said Violet, blushing. I'm an elderly woman, if one counts one's age by one's troubles. She glanced significantly at her weeds and sighed. Oh, uh, of course I understand. I, I can sympathize. I can indeed. But you shouldn't think of your troubles too much, Mrs. Van Norden, if I may say so. You should buck up. Life, after all, is... He struggled with his eyeglass and failed to enunciate his sentiments on life. "'Life is very, very strange,' said Violet, gazing pensively at the sea. "'Isn't it?' said the Major eagerly. "'Just fancy, it's only a week since I met you, what?' "'Oh, I wasn't thinking of that,' she murmured. "'I am,' said the Major. "'I think of it lots.' It seems so rum, don't you know, that I'd never seen you till a week ago. Don't you think that sometimes people meet who were meant to meet, and that for them a week scores more than years, and years of society between people who, uh, well, who only happen to meet because they're introduced, don't you know? Van Norden lay communing with herself. In the little brain, the voice of the past cried for recognition. She eyed the adults darkly, agitated by the sense of a tragedy which she sought piteously to define. The soul of the baby sprawling on the cushions was symptomatic of marital jealousy, though the mind failed to diagnose the disease. Distressed and puzzled, Van Norden burst into startling screams and kicked her little limbs about furiously. Violet was unable to pacify her and, much alarmed, was about to dispatch the Major for the nurse when, 
through the windows of the salon came the prelude to a song, and someone began to sing Heaven were a void without thee. The baby's paroxysm ceased almost at once. Her gaze grew wide. Striking her ear when it did, the ballad that she had created in her preceding incarnation revivified her consciousness of the former life. The veil was rent. The female infant was at heart a husband, and looking in the faces of Violet and her new lover, Van Norden remembered all. She could say nothing. Speech was not yet granted to her, could not proclaim, I am Otto, though she beheld her widow wooed by another man. Life holds no moment more terrible than an experience like this, nor did her agony fade with her banishment from the scene. On the contrary, her helplessness intensified her sufferings, too young as yet to toddle, incapable of intruding where she wished, Van Norden was constantly racked by tortures of the imagination. Consumed with jealousy and craving to be in the salon, she was compelled to lie fuming in her cot or was strapped in her perambulator while her frenzied fancy followed Violet and the Major into the casino. Soon she employed the only weapon in her power and kicked and screamed as often as an attempt was made to remove her from Violet's presence. By this means she witnessed much that would otherwise have been hidden from her, was indeed a witness of her successor's proposal. Stricken with resentment, the babe that had once been the widow's husband lay in her lap while the major begged her to be his wife. I know it's a bit early for me to speak, he stammered, but I can't help it if I were to let you go away without telling you how much I care for you, I might never see you again. Only give me a word. I'll wait. I'll be as patient as I can, but tell me that there's a chance for me. She was silent a long while. Evidently she was much moved. At last she murmured, I don't know what to say. Can't you care a bit for me? Ah, it isn't that, she owned tearfully. Darling, dearest, shh, she said, you oughtn't. It's so soon, and, oh, I don't know, there's so much to consider. There's my child, she clasped Van Norden protectively. You don't suppose I'd be rough on it, cried the Major. Why, I give you my word, just as if it were my own. Violet, in a few months' time... Will you marry me in a few months' time? He leant lower, and she raised her gaze. The next instant they had kissed across Van Norden's head. All the rekindled manhood in the infant's consciousness flamed to avenge the outrage, burned to strike the supplanter down, to destroy him. The disparity between the virile impulse and the tiny frame was maddening. Purpling with shame and indignation, Van Norden reared to spit at him, but could only dribble. The human brain, at the age of nine months, is incapable of supporting a strain of this degree. Soon afterwards, Violet had to send in hot haste for a medical man. After an examination, he spoke gravely of removing something. Removing something? You don't mean operating? Yes, we shall have to operate, answered the doctor. There was a morning when a hospital nurse came to the cot, putting on an apron, and the surgeon followed. Violet and the Major were present, the Major soothing her. I think we'll move the bed, said the surgeon, and Van Norden lay staring through the window at the brilliant sky. 
the room began to acquire a novel air the nurse produced sheets and cans of hot water from nowhere the surgeon poured fluids in basins briskly the major set out mysterious articles from a black bag on the chest of drawers the sky developed a pattern of pink mushrooms and bunches of vermicelli and van norden came to his senses he saw lachlan looking at him well how do you feel asked lachlan we've got rid of your mixoma for you and your wife's first rate you've a little son waiting downstairs fine boy too fine boy murmured the composer drowsily no i was a fine girl not quite come round yet nurse said lachlan let him sleep the rest of it off and he'll be as right as rain end of section nineteen section twenty of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tavarish the man who understood women and other stories by leonard merrick the bishop's comedy one the bishop of westborough had seldom found himself in a more delicate position since sweet bay objected so strenuously to its rector being a dramatist sweet bay was clearly no place for the rector and it devolved upon his lordship to intimate the fact but secretly his lordship was also guilty of dramatic authorship and installments of his comedy were even now in the hands of that accomplished actress miss kitty clarges for this reason and another the bishop had wakeful nights however he did what was required with all his customary blandness and perhaps a shade more he pointed out to the reverend baker barling that the parish of sweet bay was unsuitable for him and offered him instead a living which commended itself to the barlings not at all indeed mrs baker barling was so highly incensed by the removal that the rector had on several occasions to say my dear to her reprovingly the bishop was young for a bishop his classical features and the dignity of his carriage would have compelled attention even if he had been a mere man he never said anything noteworthy but he voiced the sentiments of the unthinking in stately language this made him generally admired it is not to be inferred that he was insincere he had been granted a popular mind he shared with the majority a strong aversion from disagreeable truths his widest reflections were bounded by the word unpleasant and every truth that was unpleasant was to the bishop of westborough one of those things that are better left undiscussed he had a warm affection for this phrase which occurred in all his articles for the cultured reviews it was a phrase that suggested much earnestness of thought while it spared him the exertion of thinking at all domestically he had been no less fortunate than in his mental limitations he possessed a little wife who listened to him with the utmost patience and he had seen both his girls make brilliant matches in their first season the history of the bridegroom had in each case been one of those things that are better left undiscussed accordingly the bishop boasted a grateful heart in fact when he reflected how abundantly providence had blessed him he was more than normally horrified to think of the impious murmurings of the poor that a personage of his environment and disposition had been tempted towards so unepiscopal a course as writing a comedy proves how true it is that nothing happens but the unforeseen it was one of the speediest conquests of miss clarges's career 
a career in which peers had been plentiful, but prelates had hitherto been lacking. He had made her acquaintance at a reception. She was clever off the stage as well as on it, and had always tempered her indiscretions with tact. Duchesses called her dear. He thought her the most fascinating woman he had ever met, and talked to her about the conditions of the English stage with considerable satisfaction to himself. "'What a dramatist your lordship would have made if you had not been a bishop,' she murmured with rapt eyes. "'Oh, uh, you are jesting,' said the bishop, asking for more. "'No, indeed I mean it,' returned the lady reverently. "'You have what we call the sense of the theatre, and it is so rare. You startled me just now.' You know by intuition things that the professional dramatist needs years of experience to find out. I can't tell you how extraordinary it is. She regarded him as if she were being confronted by a miracle. Partly because he was very vain, and partly because Miss Clarges was very good-looking, the lie that she forgot almost as soon as it was spoken had lingered caressingly with the bishop. Sitting in the palace one afternoon with nothing to do, he found himself scribbling Act One, a drawing room. He had no definite intention of continuing, still less had he a definite plot, but like everyone who is deficient in self-criticism, he wrote with prodigious facility, and his first act was finished in a few days. Miss Clarges had been a good deal surprised to receive a semi-humorous note from the Bishop of Westborough, reminding her of their conversation and hinting that he would be glad to have her opinion of a dramatic bantling. Tea and a tete-a-tete -tete -tete followed in the lady's boudoir. She found Act I all that she had dreaded, and told him it was most original. Beaming with importance, he perpetrated Act Two and read her that. She was contemplating a season of management, and in sanguine moments reflected that a practised hand might knock the bishop's comedy into something like shape, and that the bishop's name on the bills would be well worth having. So she offered various suggestions about the leading part, and was at home as often as he chose to call, and for some weeks he had chosen to call very often indeed. Remember that he was only fifty. He had married when he was twenty-five, married a girl who was taken by his handsome face and who brought him a very respectable dower. Though the dower had fascinated him more than the girl, the courtship had comprised his sentimental experiences. As has been said, he had had no reason to complain of his choice. He had been remarkably successful in all his relationships. He felt that his wife worshipped him, and her worship, and his worldly progress, had contented him fully. But now, for the first time in his career, he was thrown into intimate association with a woman who had captivated those who were seeing life, and those who had seen it, and the Bishop of Westborough fell in love with her as violently as many wiser men had done before him. As for her, it was the first time in the woman's career that she had been openly admired by a bishop. At the beginning she was attracted by his reputation, much as her youngest adorers had been attracted by her own, but presently she was attracted by his homage. He appealed to her one weakness, her vanity. Though she thought it a pity that he wanted to write a comedy, she considered him a great man. His profound belief in himself, supported by a nation's esteem, imposed on her. To have made a conquest of a pillar of the church, flattered her inordinately. 
The novelty of the situation had its effect on the actress, too, and, to her unspeakable amazement, Kitty Clarges fell in love with the bishop. It was at this juncture that circumstances had forced him to mortify the rector of Sweet Bay. The affair makes me doubt whether I ought to proceed with my own play, he admitted to her one afternoon. My dear friend. She meant, what rot? But she no longer said, what rot, even to other actresses and she wore dove-coloured gowns and had been to hear him preach. The higher life was a little trying, but she liked to feel worthier of him. My action in the matter may be misconstrued. Of course, I've simply deferred to the local prejudice, but it may be thought that I disapprove of the man's tendencies. If I figured as a dramatist myself a little later, I might be placed in an ambiguous position. Perhaps we might overcome the difficulty by a pseudonym? She looked blank. Your lordship's name will be a draw. I am afraid a pseudonym would mean waving a great deal. Financially? The pecuniary result is not important to me. But it was important to her. If the secret were really kept, you'd be waving all the kudos, too, she added. Well, we must consider, said the bishop, clinking the ice in his glass. You shall advise me, though I fear I am exceeding an author's privileges. By the way, does the manageress always offer the author a whiskey and soda? She offered you an alternative, said Miss Clodges, laughing. The whiskey and soda was your choice. But you don't really mean to throw the comedy up, do you? Think of poor me. The bishop's eyes were eloquent. Thinking of you, he said after a lingering gaze. I have this to say. You will be put to considerable expense in bringing out my work, and... Novice as I am, I'm aware that a theatre is a heavy speculation. If I withhold the advantage of my name from the piece, I shall claim to share your risk. You are very generous, dear friend. I don't think I could say yes to that. It is no more than fair. I'd rather not. I, I shouldn't care for you to find money for me said Kitty Clarges, and was conscious that she had soared into the higher life indeed. "'You are scarcely treating me as the dear friend you allow me to believe myself,' urged the bishop, missing the greatest compliment of his life. "'Oh,' she said under her breath, "'I should be serving my own ends, and besides—' "'Besides what?' It would make me very happy to think that I served you. Her eyelids fell. You have served me. I rejoice to hear it. May I ask how? You've served me by your friendship. You've given me different thoughts, taken me out of myself, done me good in some ways. She sighed deeply. I've learned that there are so much realer things than the shams that satisfied me before we met. I've been a very worldly woman, you know, don't you? Few human beings are stronger than temptations, child, he said melodiously, and yours must have been many. I used to want you to think me better than I am. Now I... I do and I don't. Oh, I can't explain. You are showing me your heart. You need not spell it. I suppose what I mean really is that I want you to know me as I am, and yet to like me just as much. I wonder if you would. He laid a gentle hand upon her shoulder. Why not put me to the test? I daren't, she said. Am I so hard? 
she shook her head silently what then i am so bad she whispered she drooped a little nearer to him why do you say such things cried the bishop you hurt me haven't you met other sinners i would have had your past free from sin oh my past she sobbed and bowed herself in his arms my past is past i am sinning now much may be done by earnest endeavor and he persuaded himself that his embrace was episcopal my child he murmured at last soothing her tenderly i will not affect to misunderstand what you have said it would be a false kindness to you nor will i be guilty of concealing the transgressions of my own heart were i a younger man i might doubt the righteousness of owning that the attachment is mutual but the years bring wisdom and at my age we see deeply my duty is to help you and i realize that i can help you only by a perfect candor i acknowledge therefore that you are indeed most dear to me oh you are great she exclaimed i shall see you still promise you'll come here don't let me lose you say it say again you love me you are indeed most dear to me repeated the bishop who thought this way of putting it sounded more innocent he got up and paced the room with agitation you ask me if i will still come here i do not disguise from myself that many might think that i should answer no many might hold it my duty to desert you in the conflict that must be waged to leave you to bear the brunt of it alone i'm not one of them flight is at best the refuge of a coward doubtier than to flee temptation is to confront and conquer it he swept the hair from his brow with a noble gesture i recognize that my highest duty is to share your struggles to solace and sustain you yes i will come we have a mighty battle before us you and i and we will fight side by side my comrade till we win in other words he ventured to go to tea there all the time and had whiskey and soda when it wasn't tea time two how much of what the stage door club said about them was fact and how much of it was fiction is a thing that could be decided only by the bishop or miss clarges neither of whom is to be consulted on the subject but the reverend baker barling who frequently dropped into the club for the house dinner or a game of poker heard the gossip and baker barling confided it to mrs baker barling and mrs baker barling whose wrath against the bishop had in no way abated manoeuvred for the joy of condoling with the bishop's wife miss clarges was paralyzed one morning by a note in which mrs lilliaton meadows mentioning that her husband was the bishop of westborough requested the actress to receive her upon a matter of the utmost importance the same afternoon the actress's first impulse was to be out when the lady called her second to telegraph to the bishop for advice the fear of driving mrs meadows to extremities and the thought that the telegram might fall into the wrong hands prevented her adopting either course she could only pray for the ability to persuade the visitor that her suspicions were unfounded and she felt sick with misgiving as the day wore on how extraordinary of the woman whether she meant to be offensive or pathetic what a folly of her to come on the stage of course such scenes were usual and kitty clarges knew exactly how she would have to behave there that she would be first mocking then attentive and finally moved to repentance 
But the theater was one thing, and life was another. In real life it was preposterous of a person to seek an interview and plead for the return of a husband's heart. In real life it was impossible to return a heart, even if one wished to do it. And in this case the wish was lacking. Miss Clodges was so infatuated by the bishop that she had even been jealous to remember that another woman had a legal claim to him. At the tingle of the bell she caught her breath. She had never seen the other woman, and mixed with her apprehension was a strong curiosity to know what his wife was like. Mrs. Meadows, announced the maid. The actress turned to the doorway trembling and saw that the lady was a dowdy little woman with a dreary face. She looked as if she lived at Turnbridge Wells. Mrs. Meadows, how good of you to call. Mrs. Meadows advanced awkwardly. It was evident that she was painfully embarrassed. Miss Clarges, I hope I haven't put you to any inconvenience, she murmured. It is an immense pleasure to me to meet you. Won't you sit down? For an instant the bishop's wife hesitated. Then she sat at the extreme edge of a chair and moistened her lips. My visit must appear very strange to you. Most kind, said Kitty Clarges. How is his lordship getting on with his play? It'll soon be finished now, I suppose. I dare say I really don't know. I didn't come to talk about the play, Mrs. Meadows faltered. I came because you might do more for me than anybody else alive. Miss Clarges, my husband is in love with you. The start, the bewilderment in the eyes, was admirable. My dear Mrs. Meadows, you need not trouble to deny it, said the lady quietly, because he has acknowledged it to me. But that isn't all. You are in love with my husband. Are you here to insult me? cried Miss Clarges, rising. I have the honor to be one of his lordship's friends. He has been pleased to discuss his comedy with me. Not unnatural, I think. Especially as I hope to produce the piece. As for what you say, there has never been a word, a syllable. Our conversation might have been phonographed for all London to hear. The indignation of her voice quivered into pain. I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. I can't understand it. She struggled with a sob and suppressed it proudly. It's cruel. I don't wonder that he admires you, said his wife thoughtfully. You have great talent. But I have seen one of your letters to him. Here it is. Miss Clarges gasped and looked at it. She sat down again very slowly. All right, she said. I am fond of your husband. Well? It was finding your letter that made me write to you. I heard weeks ago that he was mad about you, but the letter showed me that you cared for him. Oh, I know that I oughtn't to have written. I considered a long time before I made up my mind but there was so much at stake I thought you might help me. If you will listen... What for? exclaimed Miss Clarges. What's the use of my listening? Even if I promised you not to see him again, I wouldn't promise it, but if I did, would it make him any fonder of you? Do you think if I lost a man, I should beg the other woman to give him back to me? I should know she couldn't do it. I should know I might as well beg her to give me back my innocence. And I shouldn't reproach her either. I'd reproach myself. I should call myself a fool for not holding my own. Women like me don't lose the man they want. They know how easy it is for him to leave us. And we take the trouble to keep him. It's you good women who are always being left. After you've caught the man, you think you've nothing more to do. Marriage is the end of your little story. 
so you take it for granted it must be the end of his. The more you love him, the sooner you bore him. You go bankrupt in the honeymoon. You're a back number to him before you've been married a month. He knows all your life and all your mind and all your moods. You haven't a surprise in reserve for him, and then you wonder he yawns. Great heavens! To hold a man's interest, show him your heart as you pull out a tape measure, an inch at a time. I adore your husband. I venerate him. My guilty love has made me a purer woman. You can't realize that. I don't expect you to realize it. But surely you must know that if you wept and went down on your knees to me, I couldn't say, because the right's all on your side, he shall never think about me any more. You misunderstand the object of my visit, said Mrs. Meadows meekly. I didn't come to weep to you. I didn't come to beg you to say that he should never think about you any more. I came to beg you to tell me what you find in him to love. Huh? ejaculated Miss Clarges. I came to beg you to tell me what you find in him to love, repeated the elder woman in plaintive tones. You see, to you he is only an episode, but unless I choose to make a scandal, and I have daughters to consider, I must expect to spend many more years with him. If you will help me to discover some attraction in him, it will make life far easier for me. Kitty Clarges sat staring at her dumbly. You f find no attraction in him? She stammered at last. It is unconventional of me to admit it to you, but as I say, there is so much at stake, I feel justified in asking your assistance. To me he is tedious, beyond words to tell. If you would explain why you adore him, if you would show me some merit, some spark of talent or wit or humor, something to make his pretensions less intolerable, you don't know how thankful to you I should be. Your husband is a great man, she spoke with a touch of uncertainty. Oh, no, and I should be foolish to ask so much. A moderately intelligent man is all that a woman like me has the right to expect. The bishop is unfortunately very, very dull. Believe me, I have tried most conscientiously to be deceived by him. I used to read his press notices and say, Look what the newspapers say about him, it must be true. But I knew it wasn't. I used to listen to his sermons. There aren't many of them. They've been the same sermons for twenty years, and say, what lovely language, what noble thoughts! How proud his little Mildred should be! But though I was a young girl then, I knew that the lovely language was all sound and no sense, and that the noble thoughts came out of the dictionary of quotations. Oh, Miss Clarges, you are a brilliant woman, far, far cleverer than I, he must have some stray virtue that my earnest search hasn't brought to light, or you couldn't gush so romantically about him. Help me to see it. Think how he wearies me. Tell me what the virtue is. The actress was breathing heavily. Her nostrils fluttered. On her bloodless cheeks the delicacy of maiden bloom stood out in unbecoming blotches to hear that she idolized a man whom this little provincial in last year's fashions disdained as a bore robbed her of speech she had not believed there could be such depths of humiliation in the world some seconds passed while the suppliant watched her wistfully. If you don't care for your husband, I'm afraid I couldn't teach you to love him. No, no, I only thought you might help me to put up with him. I'm not unreasonable. I'd be grateful for small mercies. 
If you'd mention a ray of interest in him, I'd keep my eyes on that and make the most of it. You're not vexed with me for coming? Oh, not at all. I, I suppose you've been very amiable. Our interview has been rather quaint. I'm sorry I can't oblige you. Well, sighed Mrs. Meadows, it can't be helped, but I must say I'm disappointed. When I found out there was a woman in love with him, it simply amazed me. I felt it only right to consult you. It seemed such an opportunity to improve matters at home. Still, there it is. If you can't tell me, you can't. She was very downcast. Then I'll say good afternoon. May I offer you some tea? quavered Kitty, clinging to the mantelpiece. Thank you so much, but I'm afraid I must be going now. I promised to see our secretary at the office of the mission fund at four o'clock. Goodbye, Miss Clarges. You needn't tell the bishop that I called. It has been quite useless. She sighed herself out. Now, though Kitty Clarges endeavoured to persuade herself by turns that Mrs. Meadows was a fool, incapable of appreciating her husband, and that Mrs. Meadows was a diplomat, scheming to disenchant her with him, both endeavours were unsuccessful. She could not think the woman an utter idiot, and still less was it possible to think her a genius. Kitty Clarges was less entranced by the bishop in their next meeting. Between them lurked a dowdy little figure, regarding her with astonished eyes. The astonishment shamed her, as no homily could have ever done. The figure was present at all their meetings, and often she lost sight of the bishop's classical features and could see nothing but his wife's eyes wandering at her. His eloquence was no longer thrilling. She was obsessed by the knowledge that it wasn't good enough for the woman in the modes of Turnbridge Wells. Before long the sight of her own dove-colored gowns began to get on her nerves, and gradually she discarded them. Once, when the bishop proposed to visit her, she told him that she would be lunching out. A few days later, she wrote that unforeseen circumstances denied her the hope of producing his comedy. His urgent letter of inquiry remained unanswered. When he called for an explanation, she was not at home. End of section 20。section 21 of the man who understood women and other stories。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. A Reverie. Rebecca is in the bedroom dressing, and Lucy, who looked very sweet in her simple frock, has gone to some entertainment at her school so I am alone. It's a comfortable chair, and the room is quiet, though overhead I hear my wife as she moves to and fro between the wardrobe and the toilet table. She has heavy feet. I'm glad she is going to the Jacobses. It'll be a treat to me to spend the evening by myself. What a fine fire I've made up! and my cigar tastes better than usual. Rebecca gets fatter every day, and she has such a silly laugh. But a good woman. Few women would have done so much as she did. I ought to remember that, but instead I'm always remembering. Quite clearly I can see the room I lived in fifteen years ago with Dora. 
how cheap it was wonderful but with its refinements too she could make such pretty things why did i not marry dora my parents would have been horrified if i had married a christian i cannot think of any other reason unless it was because she didn't worry me with entreaties she never spoke of it she had been so poor and friendless she may have fancied that it would be ingratitude to ask for more than i had done and the business was my father's in his lifetime i could not afford to quarrel with him she must have known that she must have known i could not afford to quarrel with him even if i had been anxious to marry her fervently though it is all past and the shrub that was planted on her grave has grown big beyond the railings i hope she did not grieve i have wondered many times since she was so gentle and so pure that perhaps she often suffered while she smiled and kissed me and she died and was buried and the, the child the baby lucy was given to strangers to be nursed how long ago it seems in another life but i wish that lucy might have called me papa ah my cigar is out rebecca she was slimmer when her family made up the match between us yes and good-looking and my sorrow for dora had faded two or three years had passed i was my own master then and business was good i was happy with rebecca i gave her lots of diamonds and the other women envied her and at home we got on very well if we had had children of our own i wonder lucy was four when rebecca took her she asked no questions to this day she has never asked me anything it shows a big heart she is like a mother to lucy shall i ever forget how grateful i was the tears came to my eyes when she said yes she should be worshipped for such a generosity but lucy reminds me so of dora not at first ha <laughs> no just a little thing not able to talk plainly it is recently that i see the resemblance she is fourteen now and with every move she brings back dora before my eyes she has the same features the same trick of smiling sometimes with the mouth a little to one side she grows more and more like dora i look at her across the table when she and my wife and i sit at meals together and my throat gets tight the past is suddenly alive to me and i want to spring up and throw my arms round her neck but rebecca might guess the truth and it would pain her to the heart if she suspected yet it is true and i can't help it that in the child who reminds me of the dead so vividly my wife has a rival here in our home it is the child that she consented to adopt who reminds me innocently that my wife is fat and silly it is lucy who as i watch her at her lessons recalls to me the thoughtful face of the girl i used to love and i regret ah god forgive me i regret with all my soul and would be young once more with dora by my side i would see her by my side today oh, how hot it is the window should be open such a night rebecca has come downstairs she wears her black satin and powders her nose again before the mirror she persuades me to accompany her 
I shall be dull alone. My head aches. Otherwise, bye-bye. Enjoy yourself, my dearest. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Reconciliation I have often said that I could not be your wife, but I would never tell you why. Tonight, suddenly, I want to tell you why. I want to write to you. I wonder if you will understand. You've heard how my marriage ended. For many months after I divorced him, I could concentrate my thoughts on nothing but my wrongs. I had no child, no interests. The hurricane of pain and jealousy swept me day and night. Then resentment grew less vehement, faded into lassitude. By very slow degrees, I concerned myself with other things. Later, I began to dwell on scenes of my brief happiness with him, and though remembrance made me cry for the irrecoverable, to remember was sweet Moments which had been trivial while they lasted assumed in retrospect an air of exquisite companionship. It was my weakness to recall some commonplace incident and indulge myself by reanimating its minutest details. The hours that I lived most vividly were the hours that I lived in looking back. Even when I found pleasure in society again, Recollection remained a secret joy. I could forget by this time and amuse myself, had my vanities and vexations, was socially like any other woman, entertained in ordinary ways, but clandestinely I still revisited the past. So thirteen years went by, and, unsuspected by my dearest friends, I communed mentally with a young husband who, in these reveries, had grown no older. I tried to bear in mind that he was older, much older than I, but I could think of him only as I had seen him last. I repeated, marvelling, that he must be over forty now, but in my memories I laughed and talked with the personality that I had known. Although I told myself that I might pass him unrecognized, the face that I smiled to in my visions was the face of the young man that he used to be. I believe you have sometimes wondered who your rival was. He was the man that my divorced husband once had been. Last September I was at Porville. One morning in the hotel, glancing at an English paper, I read that he had just arrived in Paris. I meant to leave for Paris myself towards the end of the week, and I sat thinking how very soon he and I would be passing through the same streets. Doubtless we had drifted close to each other many times before, but I had not known it, and somehow, while well, the impulse was very strong, I wrote to him. I do not know, I wrote, whether it will please or distress you to hear from me. If my letter is unwelcome, burn and forget it. Speaking for myself, all ill feeling died long ago. Time has even taught me to think of our first year together and obliterate the rest. Our marriage was a blunder, but so much am I changed from the girl who was your wife. That seems to me, today, no reason why we should never meet again as friends. I shall be at Maurice's on Saturday. If a reconciliation would not be odious to you, if there was no one to resent it, will you come to see me? When the letter was posted, I said that I had committed an imbecility, but I am not sure that I believed myself. At any rate, I rejoiced half an hour afterwards. 
by and by of course i was sorry again and so on then on the morrow something happened i found his new volume of poems on a chair in the courtyard have you ever read any of his poems but i suppose poetry is not in your line you great strong practical builder of big bridges on the fly-leaf he had scribbled to janet herbertson from her sincere friend gilbert owen i had picked up the book eager to read some of it but i fell to dreaming over the fly-leaf wondering who janet herbertson was while i wondered she returned to her seat have i taken your book oh thank you she was a girl to whom i had already spoken once or twice i had not known her name and i don't suppose that she knew mine i call her a girl because she was unmarried but she could not have been more than four or five years younger than myself a girl with a fine figure and abundant health but to my mind at least no features worth mentioning her eyes were shallow and her hair came near to being sandy most of her remarks were prefaced by of course and she expressed herself in very incisive tones i had noticed her one day with an easel among the gorse at varangeville plage and i set her down as an amateur with means you didn't go to the links then i said not this afternoon i was too much interested in this have you read any of it no i only just saw it it's a new one of his isn't it it isn't out yet at all this is what's called an advance copy mr owen sent it to me yesterday i couldn't help seeing by the inscription that you knew him how very nice to receive such compliments from poets of course you admire his work i admire some of it very much some of it she regarded me with an offensive smile of course the best in any art is always unintelligible to the public i was certain she was an amateur now the arrogance was unmistakable i suppose so emerson have you read emerson whom's it by i asked viciously i saw her shudder emerson was one of the world's teachers apropos of the impressions to be derived from nature he said that a tourist could never take away from any place more than she brought to it of course it's the same with a reader if she hasn't the receptivity she can't receive this person educating me but i wanted to hear about him i submitted i think i follow you i murmured she unbent if you like i'll lend it to you presently i should be delighted if you can spare it yes i shan't read after dinner in the evening you always play that idiotic game though don't you well you can have it in the morning if you're sure i shouldn't be robbing you quite besides i've read most of it already in manuscript really it must be very fascinating to know a poet so well as that oh i know gilbert owen very well if you're staying next week you'll see him here she tittered self-consciously i've told him that the rest would do him good here yes but not till wednesday i didn't want him till i had finished my picture of course i shan't have much time for my work after he comes i shall be gone by then i said what a pity i suppose there's no chance of his coming before oh no he'll come on the day i fixed wednesday yes to oblige me you might let him come a little sooner i laughed i'm afraid i can't do that you had better stay i wish it were possible you must be immensely proud of your influence oh i don't know i find myself quite forgetting he's famous and thinking of him simply as a dear friend in a pause i glanced at her left hand 
there was no ring on it but i knew that she foresaw one there she turned a page of his book and for a minute or two we didn't speak again across the begonias the musicians in their red coats were fiddling drowsily and inside the croupier called numero douce what's he like eh oh it's so difficult to say what any one is like do you mean his appearance or his disposition i think i meant his disposition amusing amusing no i should scarcely describe him as amusing of course he can be very brilliant when he meets a foeman worthy of his steel but his nature is a wistful one he has suffered deeply and it has left its mark i think i remember reading something i said wasn't there a case of some sort he made a very unhappy marriage years ago she said sharply his wife was a vapid girl who didn't understand him he was very much to be pitied i nodded i could have struck her across her conceited face it must have been hideous she added for a man of his intellect to be married to a fool the begonias were making my eyes ache awful i muttered i wondered what in the world he could find to admire in her well you shall be left in peace i've a sudden fancy for sank it's my lucky number i didn't play i sat watching the horses swirl and hating her hating my idiocy and having written to him i was jealous is it heartless of me to say that to you dear man i must be frank i was jealous of her and when i had the honesty to own it at last i was glad that the letter had gone i asked myself if she had more attractions than i i asked myself it was abominable you'll despise me if i couldn't teach him to humiliate her there was no note for me at Maurice's when i arrived on friday but i had an instinct that he would come next day i spent the whole of saturday morning before the mayor i wonder my maid didn't give me notice i had my hair dressed in a new way and snapped at her till she cried before i was satisfied with it afterwards i decided that it didn't suit me and my hair was done as usual after all the same with my things i felt myself a sight in everything my frock had to be changed three times it was four o'clock when the waiter came up and frightened me my knees were trembling and the doorway was a blur gilbert nan i'm glad you've come i got out in a horrid dry whisper we shook hands he was speaking but i had turned deaf i heard a confused sound and strained to distinguish what he said his face grew clear to me before his words i saw blankly that he was like someone with a resemblance to the husband i had remembered i'm glad you've come i repeated it encouraged me to find that my voice was louder i didn't feel that he was gilbert he was someone queerly familiar, but I didn't feel that he was Gilbert. It was very good and generous of you. His voice seemed different, too. You haven't changed so much. Ah. Uh, really? How are you? All right. Won't you sit down? He twitched his trousers to save their bagging at the knees. It may have been mechanical, but it hurt me that he could do it then. "'You've been at Porville?' "'Yes, only for a little while.' "'I've never stayed there. It's very quiet, isn't it?' "'Oh, a mite of a place. Just the hotel and the sea. There are beautiful walks, though.' "'You used to be fond of walking.' "'I am still. You're looking wonderfully well. You look very well, too.' "'Do you think so?' he asked. "'Fact.' not so much older as you expected no i said my hair's going eh begins a little further back than it used to doesn't it a little more intellectual brow perhaps you should try a specialist i've tried a dozen they're no use 
the first time you go the man tells you that you'll be bald directly if you don't use his lotions ah well i'll do all that can be done for you and you buy bottles at half a guinea each and find they make no difference then when you go again to say there isn't any improvement he exclaims my i didn't hope to do so much in the time this is splendid look at all that new hair coming up of course you like to believe him and you go on buying his rubbish for twelve months a hair specialist lives by his knowledge of human nature not his knowledge of the hair i knew that he was talking for effect and i laughed to gratify him he glanced round the room you're very comfortable here yes this is where i generally stay are you often in paris not very often i'm in london a good deal i never go to london excepting to see a publisher the atmosphere is fatal in london i'm commonplace positively the murk gets on my genius give me a blue sky and god's sunshine all artistic natures are very susceptible to external influences you know that i remember you used to say so it's just the same with me now i haven't altered i feel just as i felt when i was a boy i'm young just as young in myself that's what keeps my work so fresh that's what people rave about other men's stuff ages mine doesn't everybody says so the spirit of it's as useful as when i was twenty temperament temperament i sickened at the word formerly that had been his apology Today i saw it was his boast presently i inquired about his favorite sister if she was well i don't know i don't often see her now he said indifferently i spoke of a chum he had lost a man at whose death i had pictured him grief-stricken it must have been an awful blow to you i asked oh he had got rather tedious he answered charlie was a bit of an ass he proceeded to tell me an anecdote of a woman who had paid him a fulsome compliment. While he aimed eagerly at making an impression, while his sole thought was to show me how brilliant and fascinating he remained, he revealed to me that every tendency I had once condemned had developed to a salient feature of his character, that every blemish I had once regretted had grown to be a glaring fault. I am sure that vanity would have urged him to gain my admiration, even if he had found me faded and a frump. I am sure that he had come with that desire. But his eyes told me he found me charming, and his note, by and by, I think, was unpremeditated. I wish I had been worthier of you, he said. He said it very beautifully, but late so much too late to give me any pleasure don't let us talk about the past i murmured my coming here today will make me regret it more still i hope not i didn't mean to give you pain perhaps it was foolish of me to write oh you know i am glad you wrote only it won't be the last time i see you don't say that his gaze dwelt on me sentimentally. I wish it were the first. If I had just been presented to you, we might have become great friends, Nan. Who knows? I trust we are friends. He sighed. It's noble of you to say so, but the friendship you can give me now is only a gentler name for pardon. I might have looked forward to something sweeter if we had just met. I might have won your esteem, your confidence, perhaps even your love. I wonder if you know what it has meant to me this afternoon, to be here like this, with a wall of formality between me and the woman who used to be my wife. The torture, the shame of it. My heart is full of emotion, but I may only speak to you of trivial subjects. I want to pour out my remorse at your feet, and feel your arms about me in forgiveness, but I may only touch your hand, like a stranger. 
won me pardon i was a boy who ruined his own happiness today i am a man and i realize what i've lost you make me miserable every day i have thought of you my life empty what is anything without you you mustn't talk to me like this i can't help it nan i'm so wretched it's my fault for making you come here no no but let me see you again tell me i may come tomorrow i can't it's sunday let us lunch at versailles or saint germain or somewhere let us go into the country i know a perfectly lovely spot we can motor to in an hour and the hotel is really quite decent say you will i'm expecting people tomorrow well monday tuesday you'll be free on tuesday i shook my head then wednesday i was going to the sea on wednesday but i'll stay promise to spare me wednesday how easy it had been i saw the sandy-haired girl's mortification saw her fuming week by week while he dangled at my side my petty plan had triumphed, but it brought no joy. "'I'm leaving Paris,' I said, and when he went I think he was conscious that, after all, his visit had been a failure. But he was speedily at ease again, I know, for those who have no deep affections avoid much of life's unhappiness. For the selfish is the peace. The suffering was for the woman who had felt, for me— to whom the reconciliation had proved more painful than the estrangement. For me, whom reality had robbed of a dream. Always I had seen him as he had been. Now I could see only the man he had become. Our meeting had killed remembrance. I could spend hours in the past no longer. I tried. I tried for months. But the spell was gone. The husband of my youth would come to my mind no more. I met only a middle-aged poser, from whom I turned and fled. Best of men, how I seem to you I do not know, but I have owned the truth. There is nothing more for me to write, excepting, well, all day long I have wished that you were with me, and I am feeling very much alone. End of section 22。section 23 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Paul. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Call from the Past. Once there was a prosperous solicitor, and he had two sons. The elder he took into his office, the younger he sent to the bar. The younger boy's name was Robert, and he was generally called Bob. The elder boy's name was Edward and no one ever called him Ted. Edward went to the office with satisfaction. He was a shrewd youth who made useful friends and didn't allow pleasure to stand in the way of profit. Before he had been in the business two years, he bullied the head clerk, and it was predicted that he would go further than his father. Bob entered his profession negligently. He was a genial fellow who liked bohemian clubs and wrote farces that were never produced. Before he had been at the bar two years, he succumbed to an unconquerable passion and went on the stage. The stage had not then been the smartest vocation in England. Viscounts occasionally married dancing girls, but socially that was as high as the theatre had climbed. It may be difficult for English people of today to credit it, but though old Mr. Blackstone was simply a solicitor, he felt humiliated when his son took to play-acting. 
what will be understood more easily is that he was wrathful in thinking of the money he had wasted to make a barrister of a crank. He told the crank that he washed his hands of him, and, as a matter of fact, talked rather like the irate parents in the comedies in which Bob was going to perform. Nevertheless, his growl was worse than his bite, in which he resembled the comedy parents again. Ascertaining that Bob's salary was to be fifteen shillings a week, and that the histrionic career was precarious, he undertook to make an annual contribution of forty pounds, payable quarterly for the term of three years. At the end of which time, he said, I think you ought to be able to support yourself if you have really any aptitude as a buffoon. Barring the buffoon, Bob was of the same opinion. Don't laugh at him. He was young. He slammed the door of his chambers rejoicing, and, because his father wished him to change his name, he dropped the black stone and called himself Lawless. The old man remarked that senseless would be better still, but Bob thought not. Now, if this had been a nice, edifying story with the moral presented gratis to every purchaser, Bob would have had only two courses open to him. He would either have succeeded brilliantly and moved his father to tears of pride, or he would have found the discomforts unbearable and returned repentant. In reality, he didn't succeed at all, and he had never been so happy in his life. His sole regret was that the tour was short, for when it finished he was out of an engagement. He remained out of an engagement much longer than he had been in one, and subsisted on the parental allowance. The change from the flesh pots of Regent's Park was severe, and if anything could have cooled his stage fever, it would have been cooled now, but it defied even semi-starvation. By and by he obtained another small part, and his temperature was higher still. Confidently he assured himself that by the time the allowance was withdrawn, he would be independent of it. And that was where he erred. At the end of the three years he was pacing the strand. He had had hard luck, and old Mr. Blackstone was hard too. He stuck to his guns. Bob must shift by his own abilities henceforward or Bob must go back to the bar. Bob was footsore, hungry, and penniless. Bob went back to the bar. Of course, there was still his pen. His hopes as an actor had been shivered, but to his ambitions as a dramatist he clung. His pen was the spar in the shipwreck. The night was black, but afar the footlights beamed. Buffeted as he was, he might regain them by his pen. So he wrote more farces, farces and burlesques, and one or two melodramas as well. His father did not know that. Robert Blackstone, the budding barrister, preserved appearances, and Robert Lawless, the panting playwright, preserved his manuscripts, for they all came back. All that is to say, with the exception of a farcical comedy which he had actually sold for twenty-five pounds, but which had never been staged. Some of his work was good, but in England the chief qualifications for artistic success are commercial ability and the money to exploit it. Bob lacked both. By degrees he became wary of trying to reach the limelit shore. His struggles grew fainter. By degrees... Robert Lawless took some interest in Robert Blackstone. He thought of the bar more, and of the theatre less. One day when his father told him he had handled the brief uncommonly well, he was elated. He was nine and twenty now. Robert Blackstone had begun to cut Robert Lawless out, was travelling faster, proving the better of the pair, and Lawless who felt rather sore about it at first, presently forgave him. Bob began to look less like a Bob and more like a Robert. People noticed what a strong resemblance there was between him and his brother. As an earnest young barrister, he no longer frequented bohemian clubs. 
it was understood that one mustn't go round to Plowden buildings any more and waste his time. Nobody said to him now, Come and have a drink, old chap. Occasionally someone might say, Will you, uh, take a glass of sherry, Mr. Blackstone? As the years passed, even that was seldom said. He had shaken off the dust of Plowden buildings and had chambers in Garden Court. His humour was becoming heavy. The mothers of marriageable daughters found it convulsing. He was spoken of as a man with a future, and dined at dreary houses. Old Blackstone died, and as Robert was making a handsome income, he was mentioned in the will with abundant generosity. Wherefore, he was rich. So was Edward the solicitor, who had a wife and three children now. Edward was proud of his brother. He wanted him to take silk and to stand for Beckenhampton later. Robert was thinking of these things himself. His age was forty-one. And here ends the prologue. So we see that this unedifying story may be said to begin at a point long after all orthodox stories have concluded. It really begins twelve years after the prodigal reformed. Reformation, we know, is always final in stories. When the prodigal has once returned to the order of sanctity, we are quite sure that he will never desire change of air. We understand that he will always be just as good and peaceful as we leave him on the last page. Human nature is made like that, in stories. One May afternoon, as Robert came out of court, a man murmured to another, He's a dry stick, is Blackstone. And Robert overheard and smiled his dry smile. Yes, he supposed that was his social reputation at the bar. As he joined Edward and listened to his pleased comments on the jury's finding, he even admitted to himself that the reputation might be deserved. Odd! A very different from a dry stick he had been once. Edward was animated. For Edward. He kept nodding his grey head and pinched his nose repeatedly between his forefinger and thumb, a habit that he had in conversation. They stood talking in the street for about ten minutes. It occurred to Robert, with a touch of faint surprise, that he had long ceased to shirk his brother's company. Yet there was no doubt that Edward was quite as dull a dog as he had ever been. As they talked there outside the law courts, Robert compassionated himself a little for not being bored by Edward. He had been cheerful as he unrobed, but the remark he had caught lurked in his ears, and when he entered his chambers he found himself repeating it. For the defendant, a pleasant phrase today, was momentarily forgotten. A dry stick sounded in his mind instead. He, Bob, had actually become a dry stick. And he was only forty-one. He lit a cigarette and mused. Beyond the open window the flowers of the garden were bright in sunshine, and the fountain tinkled dreamily. There was a nursemaid with a child among the flowers. He wondered for a moment whether he would have done well to marry. Marvellous in looking back how suddenly success had come. Marvellous to remember how hard he had had to flog his brain at the beginning to earn a legal guinea. If one managed to turn the second corner at the bar at all, one sped on with a rush. But how unlikely it had looked that he would ever turn that corner! How unlikely it had looked in the days when he belonged to the Amity Club, and fellows used to quote his jokes he flashed over a tankard and a stake at three in the morning. If his boyish hopes had been justified, if he had had talent as an actor, perhaps life would have tasted better to him after all. Robert Blackstone, K.C. He would soon be that. Robert Blackstone, K.C., M.P.? He might expect it. Sir Robert Blackstone, Solicitor General? It was on the cards. Why wouldn't his heart swell at the prospect? Why didn't he catch his breath? What the deuce had become of all his emotions? Oh, he was getting sentimental listening to the fountain. Shut the window, ring the bell, see what briefs had come in. And a letter, sir. All right, said Robert. Put it down. 
the eagerness with which he used once to seize his briefs, the swift glance to learn the fee, the impatience to gather the contents, other incomes, other manners. He pulled the tape off leisurely today. A dry stick, he reiterated. Oh, one had to pay for success. There was no doubt. His gaze wandered to the letter and rested on it, startled. A little quiver ran through him. For several seconds, a sensation that was half pleasure, half pain, held him quite still. The letter had been redirected from Plowden Buildings. It was addressed to Robert Lawless, Esquire, himself. Dear Sir, I have come across the strip of your farcical comedy entitled No Flies on Flossick, all rights of which I acquired some years ago. It is a bit antique in parts now, and I think you might like to bring it up to date. I am putting it on at O. H. Ashton under line to see how it shapes. We rehearse at P. O. W. Manchester. The first call is for twelve o'clock, Monday, eighteenth. Yours faithfully, Cavendish Pink. When the color had crept back to his face, Robert laughed the perfunctory laugh that he gave to a judge's joke. He shrugged his shoulders. He put the letter down and laughed again. He was acting to himself unconsciously. After a minute or two, he picked it up and reread it. How had Cavendish Pink come by the play? Acquired it? Not from the author, but the adventures of the manuscript were unimportant. Pink? Pink had been a rather popular comedian. On the seesaw of life, Mr. Pink had gone down while Mr. Blackstone went up. For the third time, he read the letter. He knew that T.R. stood for Theatre Royal, but the other abbreviations had mystified him. It occurred to him with emotion that O.H. meant Opera House and that P.O.W. meant Prince of Wales, that he could have forgotten these things even for a moment. He drummed his fingers on the briefs and saw his youth. Of course, he could have nothing to do with the matter. No flies on Flossie, no flies on Flossie, the work we understand of Mr. Robert Blackstone, the well-known barrister, etc. He shuddered in imagining such a paragraph. He said that it was lucky Robert Lawless was forgotten. Certainly, Robert Lawless would reveal nothing to anyone who saw the piece at Ashton under Lyme, and doubtless its run would begin and end there. If he were silent, nobody would suspect his connection with it, but, well, if this had happened a few years earlier, he would have gone down to the place just for a day to see the performance. He said he would have felt curious about it a few years ago. Three or four hours had passed before he confessed to himself that he was curious now. He was in his library after dinner, and though he had no intention of humouring his curiosity, he humoured his mind. It dwelt on scenes in the farce that had appeared to him brilliant when he wrote them. Would they appear brilliant today? He remembered the evening when he scribbled, Curtain, and Dick turned up and heard the last act read, Jove! I didn't think you had it in you, Dick had said. He was sitting on the window sill. How it all came back, how time flew. The score of hopes and disappointments the work had brought. With what passion he had despaired at that age. Could he despair so passionately at this? And then the excitement when the thing was taken. What a whirlwind of exultance. That night that he got the news... He had dragged Dick out for oysters just before Scott's closed, and afterwards they had sat up talking till daylight. The piece was to be produced a few weeks hence, and Dick was stipulated for two stalls on the first night to take his girl thirteen years ago, and Dick was dead. On the morrow, Robert decided that he might, after all, run down to Ashton under line, he said he would not enter the stage door. No one would surmise that the author was present. He would simply take a seat in the dress circle like anybody else. Why not? To associate himself with no flies on Flossie was impossible, but to resist the desire to peep at it would be motiveless. No doubt when he was in the theatre, 
he'd be hotly ashamed of having perpetrated such trash still. He made no reply to Cavendish Pink. He was not prepared to revert to comic dialogue, even under a pseudonym, nor did he see his way to correspond on the subject. Probably it would be inferred that the letter had gone astray or that Mr. Lawless had died. Well, he was dead. Yet Robert Blackstone owned to himself that he regretted being unable to attend Bob Lawless's rehearsals. He did not own it all at once. He regretted it for some time before he owned it. Then he said again that if this had happened a few years earlier, he might have... Eh? Just for a day or two? Yes, he would have given himself the fun then. It wouldn't have mattered so much a few years earlier. How ardently, in the period when he was a small part actor, he had looked forward to striding about a stage as the author and telling the company what to do. He had never rehearsed in the West End Theatre, or he would have known that authors are rather small fry after the plays are written. It had been his dream. The author. And, of course, he would be privileged to smoke. He had imagined himself with a cigar between his lips and his hands in the pockets of a fur overcoat. In his dream, it was generally winter, because he wanted to wear a fur overcoat. Nice girls waylaid him in the wings and said, Do write in a line for me to speak, Mr. Lawless, please. And he did, the courtly consideration that he had always shown in his dream to the humblest member of the cast, the glowing terms in which everyone had spoken of him in his dream. It would have been agreeable to go to Manchester for the rehearsals. About a week later, he said that, of course, he wouldn't be so stupid, but that, as a matter of fact, he could go if he chose. He could go as Mr. Lawless. It was in the highest degree unlikely that anyone in a third-rate provincial company would know his face. He wouldn't do it, because he had long ago left such follies behind, but there was really nothing else to prevent him. The first call is for a twelve o'clock Monday, 18th instant. Constantly the man thought of it. Sometimes he fingered the letter again, daily, in the drawer of his desk, under the documents, under the briefs, it tempted him, the call from the past. Oh, out of the question. He supposed it would be a folly. After all, should he go? If the Easter term did not end on the 16th of May, there would have been no story, but it does. He felt strange to himself when he took his ticket on Sunday. He felt excited, nervous, guilty. On the platform, he avoided a man whom he knew. He realized the sensations of a fugitive from justice and threw an apprehensive glance about the restaurant car. What should he say if he were asked where he was going? He was sorry the rehearsals were to be held in a big city like Manchester. What more likely than that an acquaintance would run against him in the street? As to the hotel, it would brim with danger. At any moment, someone might exclaim, How do you do? What has brought you here? But to be sure, he merely meant to remain in a hotel for the night. On the morrow, he would go into lodgings. They would be extremely uncomfortable, but at all events, they would be private. And it was only for a week, after all. A week would soon pass. He found himself wishing that it had passed already. Rain was falling when he arrived at Manchester. He spent a melancholy evening in the smoke-room. Presently he saw a theatrical paper, and turning it over, observed advertisements of professional apartments. Several of the advertised houses were in Manchester. The idea of installing himself in theatrical lodgings again carried a little tremor with it, but it was not unpleasant. These addresses to his hand, moreover, would spare him trouble. Rain was falling when he shaved. No matter. It would be well to make his arrangements before he went to the rehearsal. He breakfasted briskly, opposite a commercial traveller who performed extraordinary feats with a knife and fork. 
At ten o'clock he had his bag put on to a cab. All saints, he said, for in Manchester all theatrical landladies and all saints are neighbours. The side streets of all saints were not prepossessing. As he rang the first bell, he glanced about him wonderingly. Had he really been happy in places like this when he was young? He was relieved when the slatternly householder answered that she had only a combined room. He interviewed several householders without success. Gradually, the manner in which he made his applications lost something of its legal stiffness. He labored for a touch of the old-time freedom which he knew was demanded by the situation. He rang another bell, and a young woman in curling pins came to the door. "'What rooms have you got this week?' asked Robert, uneasily familiar. "'What do you want?' said the woman. "'I want a sitting-room and bedroom,' he said, and she was able to accommodate him. Against the piano was a pile of comic songs. On the mantelpiece were likenesses of performers in tights. The rooms were cosily furnished, and the rent was ten shillings a week, inclusive of gas and fires. The Manchester weather was still chilly. "'I'll take them,' said Robert. When he had unpacked his bag, he smoked a cigar in the parlour and smiled. "'One always returns to one's first love,' he mused. Really, the first love looked attractive, though he viewed the signboard of a mechanical chimney sweep through the window. Presently, he asked his landlady for her card. "'I'll give you my professional card,' she said, "'but it has got the address on it. I'm in the profession myself.' He read, "'My lady superba terpsichorean gymnast.' "'That's me,' she said, pointing. "'That portrait there. I only let rooms as a obby. I don't let regular all the year round. Think it's good?' It doesn't flatter you, said Robert, but she was captivating in her gymnast costume. He would never have supposed the photograph was meant for her. I'm fortunate to find you, letting, this week. Well, it's like this. It gives me something to do when I'm at home. That's what my husband says. He says, it gives you something to do, and I don't take ladies. They're a bit too much. Can we have some hot water, ma? All hours of the day. Can I come and eat my curling tongs in the kitchen fire, ma? Ladies are a handful, and, as I say, I only let as a hobby. I'm going on tour again in August. Perhaps you've seen me in the halls? I've often applauded you in the halls, he said, courteously and truthful. I was puzzled why your face was so familiar to me. He was conscious that he hadn't recovered the note yet. He knew that he was being much too formal. Could he pluck up the spirit to call a landlady Ma again himself? There was an unaccustomed exhilaration in his veins as he drove to the Prince of Wales's. He did not define the feeling, but what he felt was younger. When the cab jerked to a stoppage, his pulses beat like a lover's. He leapt out and saw stage entrance painted on a dirty door. Again he pulled a stage door open. What name? he was asked. Mr. Lawless, he answered, and all at once he did not know if he was happy or ashamed, but he knew that he trembled. The theatre looked dark for the first minute. He received a dim impression of ill-dressed people, drew a breathful of mouldy atmosphere that swept him back into the past. A vociferous man shook hands with him and called him, My boy, so you turned up, my boy. That's all right. Afraid you hadn't had my note. How do you do, Mr. Pink? responded Robert. They sat down in the stall swathed in holland wrappers, and the mist before them melted. The ill-dressed people acquired features. He realized that the rehearsal had begun, and that the figures on the stage were the butler and the maidservant reading the opening scene of his farce. It wants refreshing up, Lawless, said Mr. Pink. It's a bit Noah's Arky here and there, old-fashioned. Still, I think there's stuff in it. I'd like you to keep your ears open, see where you can stick in some lines, make it modern, my boy, make it a bit topical, you know what I mean. Oh, er, uh, of course, said Robert, with dismay. Yes, certainly I must see what I can do. 
He was painfully embarrassed. He had not felt so nervous since the day he heard himself pleading in court for the first time. When the vociferous man left him, he thanked heaven. Vaguely, he thought of making his escape, of sending a telegram to say he was recalled to town. Mr. Lawless? A pale, shabby girl had come to him. She had very beautiful grey eyes. He was surprised that he had overlooked her. Yes, he said. I'm to play Flossie. I wanted to ask you a question about her. Is she simple in the first act, or only putting it on? He had no longer any views on the subject, but it would never do to say so. Simple, he said. Oh, decidedly simple in the first act. That's what I thought, she nodded. And Mr. Pinks wants me to do it the other way. Mr. Pink says she's only putting it on. He perceived that he had encouraged her to defy the management. Of course, he added hastily, when I say simple, I mean relatively simple. Everything is relative. Oh, yes, she said. But she was evidently at sea. After a moment she went on. What I really want to know is how she is to speak those lines sitting on the hamper. Is she sincere in that speech, or isn't she? That, of course, is the question, murmured Robert. Yes, precisely, that speech is the... the... It's the keynote to the part, she said. He wished distressfully he could remember what speech she meant. Perhaps, after all, he had better be frank. To be quite honest with you, he said, I wrote the piece a good many years ago, and since then I... Oh, I see, she laughed. <laughs> How funny. Since then you've written so many others that you've forgotten what it's about. Exactly, said Robert. That is to say, not at all. I haven't written any others, but I have forgotten what it's about. They regarded each other silently for a moment. She seemed a singularly nice girl. I was quite a young man when I wrote it, he said abruptly. And you've done nothing since? Well, uh, not in the dramatic line. You're rehearsing my last attempt. Oh, I do hope it'll be a success, she said earnestly. Then you'll go on working. It must be rather, rather queer to see us rehearsing a piece you wrote so long ago. It is, said Robert, very queer. He paused again. He was again abrupt. Once I knew every line of the three acts by heart. She lifted her eyes to him gravely and didn't speak for a second. He liked her for not speaking. He saw that she understood. How it must take you back, she whispered. He sighed and smiled. So you see, Mr. Pink probably knows more about your part today than the author does. <laughs> you needn't tell all the company what I've said. As if I should, she exclaimed. Oh, there's my cue. I must fly. Miss Wilson, shouted Pink. Come on, Miss Wilson, please, take up your cues. My fault, called Robert, I'm to blame. He looked back over her shoulder, smiling at him as she ran, and somehow the rehearsal was more interesting to Robert. The nice girl read the lines he had invented years before, and listening to her, he remembered. Rain was falling when the rehearsal finished. She had an umbrella. Which way do you go? he asked, as the stage door slammed. All Saints, she replied. Rumford Street. That's my way, too. I want a cab. I can give you a lift. A cab? She was openly astonished. If you must squander money, you can take a penny car. But why not walk? Is that what you do in the wet? Well, if I took a cab every time it was wet in Manchester, my salary wouldn't go far, would it? I have no idea what your salary is. Three pounds, she said frankly. It isn't much for a leading lady, eh? It isn't much for a leading lady, but it's a good deal for a young girl. In any other business, three pounds a week wants a lot of earning. Oh, I know, she said. I've got young brothers in the city. They call me the millionaire of the family. Do they like your being on tour alone? Well, you see... It was necessary for me to earn my own living. Things weren't very bright at home when I grew up. I don't spend all my salary on the delicacies of the season. 
I send half to my mother every week. I couldn't be any help to her if I were in a clerkship like the boys. But you're fond of the stage, aren't you? You sounded enthusiastic when you floored me with those questions. She shrugged her shoulders. At the beginning, I was in love with it. I've been in the profession eight years now. You're giving me all your umbrella. There's no expense attached to that, said Robert. The cars were full, and she was evidently averse from a cab, so they went along Oxford Street afoot, keeping close together. I suppose you'll go and see a show tonight? she inquired. I hadn't thought of it, he said. Shall you? There's nothing else to do when one isn't playing. It's ghastly sitting in diggings all the evening, isn't it? It must be dull if you're alone, he asserted. It occurred to him that his own evening was going to be very dull indeed. Oh, I'm not alone. I'm with the girl who plays Aunt Rachel. But it's dull anyhow. We thought of asking for seats at the St. James. I... I think, said Robert, that I'll go too. Perhaps I shall see you there? Or we might all go together, mightn't we? Why, yes, she replied. It would be very nice. Let's. It would be delightful, said Robert. Yes, let's. They had reached her door, and she asked him if he would go in and have some tea. He said he would. They found the other girl at home, toasting crumpets. Miss Wilson toasted crumpets. Robert toasted crumpets also. They all knelt on the hearthrug and toasted crumpets together. His hostess cried that they were rising in their profession, having the author to tea. He laughed. He cracked a joke. He wondered what Edward would say if he could see him. At the St. James, the girls obtained two stalls for nothing, and Robert insisted on paying for one, though Miss Wilson reproved him for such waste of money. We could quite easily have asked for three, she said. It is silly of you. You make me angry. Greatly daring, he proposed supper when the performance was over. The restaurants of Manchester were far to seek, but he didn't know that. He even told himself that it mattered nothing if he were recognized. The girls were ladies. A man had a right to take his friends to supper. However, they wouldn't go. That is to say, Miss Wilson wouldn't go. The other girl looked as if she wanted to. Miss Wilson said he must wait to see if his piece was a success. If it is a hit, well, perhaps. He understood that she took it for granted he was poor. She wouldn't let him be extravagant. The situation was not without a charm. They chattered gaily as far as her apartments. I can't ask you in after the show, she murmured. No, I know, he said. I remember, as he strolled on. He reflected that the day had been remarkably agreeable. He made for his lodging in high good humour. In Oxford Street he started. He received a shock. Almost he staggered. He had perceived that he was whistling. The Terpsichorean gymnast gave him eggs boiled to perfection in the morning, and much better coffee than he got at home. As he tapped the second shell it occurred to Robert that he had not opened a newspaper yesterday extraordinary. How often he had winced in recollecting that he never looked at a newspaper when he was a provincial actor, and actually he had been as bad again. He bought the Manchester Guardian and other papers after breakfast, and kept glancing at the clock. It was rather jolly to sally forth to rehearsal, though when it was time to go rain was falling. He entered the theatre with zest today. Even he resented less stiffly the vociferous man's calling him my boy. Miss Wilson's pale face smiled at him as at a friend. He conversed with one or two other members of the company, and saw his way to inserting a topical allusion in the dialogue. Pink pronounced it devilish good. Robert the Reviving was gratified that Pink thought his line devilish good. When he was asked vociferously if he would... Come across and have a drink. He didn't say no. They drank prosperity to the piece in a vulgar bar, and he took back a box of sandwiches, and Peggy Wilson and Aunt Rachel, and he shared them in the stalls. Almost the next thing that Robert realized vividly was that it was Friday. Rain was falling. 
It amazed him how the interval had flown. Aunt Rachel had gone over to Bury, where her fiancé was playing at the Royal, and Miss Wilson, left alone, was coming to tea. Robert had ordered cream with the tea and simmel cake. He stood at the window, eager-eyed. The signboard of the mechanical chimney-sweep did not obtrude itself to him. He remembered how long it was since he last watched for a girl to come to tea. But when she turned the corner, he remembered only that he was to have a gracious afternoon. He wheeled the armchair to the hearth for her and brought her a footstool. She was less talkative than usual. Somehow, the first few minutes were disappointing. I have to go on Tuesday, he marked presently, and then it'll be all over. But you're coming to Ashton under Lyme for the production. I don't know. I don't know that I shall be able to. I wish I hadn't to go back. I haven't enjoyed anything so much for years. By the way, I want you to do me a favor. I want you girls to come to supper with me on Monday night. I thought we might go and see a show. He didn't notice that he was saying show again instead of theater, and have a little supper here afterwards. I'd suggest a restaurant, but there'd be no time to eat anything before we were turned out. What would your landlady say? I've sounded her. I said, I suppose you wouldn't think there was any harm in me bringing two ladies in to supper after the show one evening. Certainly not, Mr. Lawless, she said. Would you like it hot? That's a landlady that is a landlady. Will you? We'll see about it, said Miss Wilson. You might say yes, he begged. Give me a happy memory for the end. But it won't be the end. We shall often see you, shan't we, if the piece runs? Perhaps it won't run, and even if it does, I'm a busy man. Too busy to think of your pals. What do you do? Are we pals? he questioned. I'm yours, but are you mine? Really? You've known me such a very little while. No longer than you've known me. It's not the same thing, though. You meet lots of men. I don't meet lots of girls. To me... This week has been quite out of the common. To you, it's only one of the fifty-two. What do you do in London? She inquired again. What are you? A dry stick, said Robert. Well, you aren't a dry stick in Manchester, she said. It was not a brilliant reply, but she couldn't have made one that would have pleased him more. Yet the tea was a failure. She never ate cake, she told him. Somehow she didn't care for tea either this afternoon. She sipped about a quarter of a cupful. He had scarcely stirred his own when she was declaring she must go. You won't think it rude of me if I run away now. He gave her her muff blankly. A creature of moods, as changed as an April day. But when she was sunny, how sunny! The table looked pathetic to him when she had gone. He stood at the window downcast. The signboard of the chimney sweep darkened the road. Mademoiselle Superba put the simmel cape on the top of the piano because there wasn't a sideboard, and it stood there uncovered till it was dusty. Then the night of the supper arrived, and there was a galantine, and prawns in aspic, and a mayonnaise, and the first thing the creature of moods did when she came in was to pounce on the dusty cake and devour a slice before she took her hat off. Peggy! exclaimed the other girl reprovingly. I may? she cried, flashing a glance at Robert. Yes, she knew she might. She knew she might do anything she chose here. I'm going to have another light, she said, and lit another burner of the gasolier. Mademoiselle Superba, majestic in black silk, with pendant pearls in her ears, and her hair dressed like true Fitz widow, looked in for a moment to ask if all was well. Robert thanked her for doing it so extremely well. Peggy said sweetly, I hear you're in the profession too. The woman was pleased at that. So was Robert. It was nice of Peggy. Because there was no sideboard, cutlery and plates were set forth on the piano. Because there was no champagne glasses, they drank the champagne out of tumblers. Didn't I forbid you to be extravagant? cried Peggy. He liked forbid. Forgive me, he smiled. This once, she laughed. 
but you must be very economical in London. I shall have no parties like it in London, I assure you. Nor I, said she. Do you live in London? She threw him a nod. Couch end. Tell me more, he urged, and let me give you both some salad. More? Well, once we had a servant, now we haven't. I do housework when I'm at home. I blacklead the grates. That's why my hands aren't pretty. Don't, he said, pained. Her hands weren't pretty, but he revered them now he knew the reason. Peggy, said the other girl, dismayed. The other girl was obsessed by manners when she was out. I'm frightfully untidy in the morning. In novels, the poor heroine always has on snowy cuffs and collars with her rags, pickles. In real life, the poor heroine has to think of the laundry bills. Oh, you'd be shocked at me in the morning. After the boys have gone, I turn a room out sometimes, my skirt pinned up and a duster over my head. Can you see me? Mother's not very strong. The cooking's business enough for mother. Then I go up to the agents and try to get something to do. In a very smart costume, with a picture hat, I made it, and white gloves. Oh, you'd be impressed by Peggy in the afternoon. You wouldn't recognize me in the Strand. You're not seeing my best clothes here, don't think it. I'm in an engagement. I'm stopping the expenses. Peggy! groaned the other girl again. He divined a kick under the table. You're coming down to see the dress rehearsal on the 5th, Mr. Lawless, she struck in. It would be a treat to me, but I can't. I have somewhere else to go. It would be a treat to him, peeled Peggy. We shall be kept in the theatre half the night. We shall be dog-tired, and he would find it a treat. <laughs> what it is to be young. Where have you to go, Mr. Dramatist? I have to go to a very dull public dinner on the 5th, he said. I shall think of you dog-tired in the garden act when they serve the champagne roti. Send us the champagne roti, she said. It'd be much more use. She snatched a prig of parsley from a dish and stuck it in her hair. Mother always tried to kill my passion for dress, she cried. He proffered her mayonnaise, and she said she wanted to play the piano, though he feared that even a landlady who was a terpsichorean gymnast might have objections to her rattling Floridora at one in the morning. His spirits were high until she forsook the music-stool and sank to reminiscence on the hearthrug. Then she made his heart ache. She told him some of her vicissitudes. No engagement, no money, no food. His eyes filled as he listened. What this girl had been through. It was two o'clock. He saw his guests home. Rain was falling. Good night. Goodbye. He looked at Rumford Street for the last time, how familiar it had become. Don't forget me, he heard himself whisper, clasping Peggy's hand. Her gaze assured him. She went in. The step was desolate. He turned thoughtfully away. And as he walked back to the room where she had been, he knew he was in love with her, with the theatre, with the life he used to lead. In the wet black streets of Manchester, he saw the naked truth, and he realized that his life was a failure. A man could change his environment, but not himself. He felt that he would be happier earning three pounds a week, like her, on the stage, than he would ever be as Robert Blackstone, K.C. One mustn't say these things, but he felt it, felt that he would rejoice to be a minor actor again, and see Peggy in the morning, and see Peggy every day. No flies on Flossie, tottered for six nights, died, and was buried. You may read those facts elsewhere. These are the facts concerning no flies on Flossie, which you may read only here. And in Garden Court, Temple, there was for a long time a distinguished barrister debating a subtle point. He questioned if, when he made a trip to the past and grew enamored of it, he fell in love with a girl or only with an atmosphere, because that he was in love, still in love, was indisputable. He looked back constantly and yearned. The sole doubt was, with what was he in love? It was the weak spot in the case, and with his usual keenness he put his finger on it. He discerned how liable he was to be deceived, 
how naturally he might be attributing to the girl the fascination that belonged to the surroundings. If it was the atmosphere that lent Peggy enchantment, he would be insane to choose a wife so different from, say, the placid matron who blessed Edward. Per contra, if he loved Peggy herself, why should he tramp the room like this, instead of asking her to marry him? He swore he did love the girl herself. He trembled, lest her halo was the limelight. Then, having come to a conclusion, he found her advertisement in the stage, and wrote asking her to call on him, at Mr. Blackstone's chambers. She went promptly. The dignified clerk ushered her into Robert's presence, and Robert had never seen that room look so gay. "'How good of you to come!' he exclaimed happily. "'How good of you to think of me, you mean,' she said. "'I have been out ever since no flies finished. Have you written another piece? And are you going to offer me a part in it? I say, you do no swells. Who? Blackstone?' She nodded. Do you think he'll come in while I'm here? I was reading about him the other day. Miss Peggy Wilson would be going strong meeting celebrities at the bar. This is the Blackstone, isn't it? The KC? He's a very recent KC, murmured Robert. There's his new wig in that box. Ooh, do let me look, she said, darting radiantly. May I? You may even try it on, if you like, said Robert. You wouldn't mind. She had her hat-pins out in a second. Oh, isn't Peggy going strong, she laughed. How does it suit me? And then turning from the strip of glass. Why are you so grave all of a sudden? Didn't you mean me to? Yes, yes, I was thinking what a fool I had been not to beg you to come sooner, sighed Robert. Take it off and let me talk to you. Serious? Very serious. An engagement. You are a tramp. I wanted one so badly. Ah, but you mustn't accept this one unless you like it, and I hope you don't mind its being a short engagement. Peggy, I love you. I love the ground you walk on and the clothes you wear, and everything you say and do. Will you be my wife? Oh, she gasped. Her face was colorless. Can't you care for me? I do care, she whispered, and it seemed incredible, yet they were round her, and his heart was thumping like a boy's. Oh, my sweet, he stammered, releasing her at last, just like a boy. Oh, my sweet. And her color came back, and she smiled up at him, with a smile that no other woman had ever equaled. Let me put on my hat before Blackstone comes in, she said joyously. Look what you've done to my hair. It'd give us away. Peggy, said Robert. I'm Blackstone. The smile faded. She stood gazing at him, wide-eyed. I called myself Lawless when I wrote that farce. Then I chucked writing and went in for the bar. I'd forgotten all about the thing for years when I got Pink's note, but I couldn't resist going down to the call. I went as a lark. Nobody knew me. I thought it wouldn't make any difference. And then I met you, Peggy. And it made all the difference in the world. Why don't you laugh? You're a great man, the girl said solemnly. You oughtn't to marry me. Oh, my dear, he cried, don't you understand that I, the real I, am the man you saw there, and that only you do see the real me? London has forgotten the author of that piece, but he didn't die, darling. His heart's just the same, though he looks so different. Robert Blackstone's the man who wears the wig and gown and can make things right for your mother and the youngsters, and who'll give you a title by and by, my love. But your husband'll be the bohemian who toasted the crumpets and lodged at Mademoiselle Superba's, the terpiscorian gymnast. You shan't have time to wish for anything. I'd like to buy the earth for you, and you must come to hear me speak, and I want you to be proud of our position. But at home, I shall always be the boy who fell in love with you, Peggy, the Bob Lawless who went to look for his youth and found it. Beyond the open window, the flowers of the garden were bright in sunshine, and the fountain tinkled dreamily. There was a nursemaid with a child among the flowers. He knew with thanksgiving that he was doing well to marry. Will you kiss me again, sweetheart? Yes, she said, 
Bob. The End End of Section 23 Recording by Jason Paul End of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick